Well, hey everybody, it's Josh with Resort TV One, and I am live for a very special and exclusive interview with Haunted Mansion bride Kat Cressida. Hope everybody's having a great night tonight. Uh, we're excited. We're still summoning Kat from regions beyond, but uh, we are definitely excited to have her on here here in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about some of the things we always talk about at the beginning of the streams. If this is your first time on Resort TV One, please be sure to hit that red subscribe button right below the video and also hit that notification bell so that you do get notified every time we go live or have a new video. And also be sure to follow us on social media. We're Resort TV One on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, we'll talk about cat uh, social media as well. And we'll talk about... Um, about uh, all the ways that you can help her with her charitable efforts. We appreciate all of your help with that. And we appreciate everybody being here tonight. And we're well over 200 in the chat tonight already. So we appreciate you guys. Hopefully notifications going out to everybody. So we're going to talk uh, for just a minute while we're still summoning Kat from Regents Beyond. We'll check with Madam Leota and see if we can get all that hooked up there. But uh, once uh, once we once we get her uh, summoned in here, uh, we will actually uh, be able to ask some questions. But in the meantime, if you guys would think of some questions you'd like to ask, of course, I have a list of questions and I'm happy to ask all those and see where the conversation goes. But if you have something that you would like to ask her, whether it be about, you know, Haunted Mansion, uh, Dexter, or any of the, the you know, uh, voice matching for Jesse, any of the various things that she's done, the, the wide plethora of things that she's done, definitely... Uh, or even if it's just about voice acting or acting in general, definitely uh, make sure that you uh, leave those comments there and um, in the chat, and I will start to take note of some of the questions that I feel like um, that I feel like we can fit into the show. So uh, let me go ahead. I have to I have to make one change really quick to the stream, and then I'll say I'll make sure I'm saying hi to everybody. So, but thanks for being here tonight, everybody, and um, we really appreciate just everybody's. Uh, time every time we have a stream you guys come on um and uh, are are here the community uh, is is so awesome no matter what so we appreciate you guys very very much and um and we had a great stream last night too jen and i had a great time down at uh, the uh, magic kingdom monorail resorts and seeing the easter egg exhibits and all that stuff was so much fun it's so cool so all right there we go let's say hi to some people um so here we go and i saw somebody posted some uh, on twitter so i have not seen those yet but i will look at them and when i looked a few minutes ago there wasn't anything but maybe you just posted them so so we got mom and dad here hey mom and dad and, and apologize i'm kind of looking to the right here because that's where my chat is so i need to figure out a way to get it in the middle of the screen but if you're wondering where am i looking i'm looking at the chat uh elliot's here summer tim mom and dad brad joey's world uh, yep, the the intro is taped. That's right. The the interview is going to be live. I just have the yeah the pre recorded little one minute intro just to get everybody excited for the video. I should have done like haunted mansion music, but <laughs> I didn't have time. Uh, Vicky Gillespie, road trip Dave. Wait, speaking of haunted mansion, check this out. Whoa, there it is. <laughs> All right, so uh, road trip Dave, Minnie Bell, Octavia, Colin, Jerry, a uh, twenty TLM. Uh, let's see, Thunderbum, uh, Rob Fuzz, um, Sandra. Let's see, Elliot. That was epic. I love that too. <laughs> I love that intro. And uh, our compo one of our composer friends did that intro for us uh, with the. Um, I, I took Disney music for the intro, but then I've got the place where the choir sings Resort TV One. It's really pretty cool. Uh, Joy in minutes. Craig's Robotics. Uh, let's see. Road Trip Dave. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Thanks for being here, everybody. Got a lot of great people here in the chat. Octavia. I know, Dave, you've been retweeting some of the stuff that Kat has been sending out, too, with her awesome Disney history uh, tweets every morning. Hey, Sandra. Hello, Lee. Janie B. Octavia. Let's see. Craig, if I'm going to read your name twice, and I'm sorry. Um, Road Trip Dave. I said Candy Orlando. Kathy. Um, FPM. Jan S. Disney. Um, let's see. I watched the first interview this afternoon, so I wouldn't have to wait that long for part two. Hey, that's perfect. <laughs> Hello, English kids in America. Kevin Sparrow's here. Shannon. So I don't see any questions yet. Maybe I looked over it. Uh, Angela Fouts, uh, feeling stronger, may go home tomorrow. Yeah, Angela, guys, if you don't know, had surgery last night. So I'm so glad that you're feeling stronger and, and doing well. I'm very, uh, very glad. We were definitely uh, praying for you last night, and we're hoping that uh, we're hoping that things went smoothly. So thank you for sharing uh, your uh, your struggles with us. But we're glad that it's going well now. Four Kingdom Trekkies, Pamela, Riley, Ernesto, uh, Katie Howe. Let's see here. Blessings from Puerto Rico. Hello, Armando. Uh, how long does she voice Jesse for on Toy Story? That's a great question. So maybe just a little bit more about, uh, you know, maybe what projects and, and, and how long she voiced it for. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Because uh, I do have a little something in there about, about voice matching for Jesse on there. So that's awesome. Such an iconic voice, too. Uh, Joan Cusack and, and uh, Jesse the Cowgirl. So awesome. All right. So what else do we have? Does anybody else have any other questions? 
Uh, Kat's been putting out some awesome stuff on, uh, yeah, for sure, on Twitter. Um, oh, my. <laughs> All right. Somebody just sent me something at the Cast Warehouse. Um, so, wow. I can't share this on the stream, but... Um, <laughs> If you if you if you're if you're friends with a cast member, you know that they have a warehouse uh, off backstage where they have different things that Disney isn't using anymore, uh, and only cast members can go in there. And somebody sent me this amazing thing, and I, my text back was like, "Wow, how much? <laughs> that and where would I put it?" Right. All right. So, let's see. We got Hassan. We got Vicky Gillespie, JL, Octavia, uh, McPutt Putt. I'd love to hear more about Kat's past training experience with acting, voice acting, if she has any advice for those like me who are interested in taking classes. That is great. I have that in there already. That's an excellent question. Um, and thank you for um, for putting that in there as well. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit more about acting and voice acting tonight as we didn't have time to get into that last time. So uh, she can definitely give you some uh, some pointers, uh, both in the, the on-camera and then in the voice acting as well. And... Um, especially advice for people that are that are wanting to get into the business whether you know whichever uh, facet of the business it is <laughs> anyway so i said if you, if you have to ask you can't afford it yeah exactly <laughs> all right <clears throat> how should one train if one, one wants to do voiceover work that's great let me put let me put that in there a lot of great voiceover questions here so let me find a good place for that i have a little document going with my questions so i don't miss it um, okay, so there we go. So I've got, let's see, so this is, um, how should one train if one wants to do voiceover work? Okay, great. Fantastic. And then the other one was, um, more info, more info about cats past training and experience. Yeah. Okay. With acting and advice. Yep. I kind of had that in there, but I just wanted to get more specific to make sure we got your question answered. So, uh, my wife, Tracy loves the haunted mansion. She says hi to cat. That's awesome. Yeah. You guys can say hi to her here in just a minute. We're just almost ready. Almost summoning, almost finished summoning her from the beyond. And she is, uh, definitely, uh, definitely going to, uh, <clears throat> be able to answer all these questions at, and, uh, here in just a second. Give me just a second, guys. <laughs> Looks like I am going to be taking a call from the beyond here. So <laughs> hello. I, I can't. So, uh, but, but I'll, I'll, I'm ready to go. So I'm, I'm going to bring you on. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. So, um, there we go. All right, so Kat is ready to go, everybody. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I guess I didn't hear she was going to tell me when she was here, but she is here. I can see it now. There we go. There she is. All right, so guys, you can't see her yet, but I'm going to bring her in. So just a little bit about her background. You already may know or you may not know. Um, so <clears throat> um, just some of the things that she's done before I bring her in here. Um, Disney fans, of course, know our special guest is the amazing voice and face of the bride in the Haunted Mansion attic, Constance Hatchaway. Um, and that's, of course, uh, what Disney fans know her best for. But besides on a, besides this iconic role, she has, has an amazing list of experiences of voiceovers in several different genres, TV, sports, movies, video games, and, of course, uh, theme park attractions. And she's also a voice match for Jesse the, the Cowgirl uh, for Toy Story Projects. Uh, she was Dee Dee from Dexter's Laboratory, uh, even uh, done some voiceover and voice matching for Princess Leia in some Star Wars video games. Uh, she's voice masked actresses such as Sigourney Weaver, Weaver and Hathaway, Julia Roberts and Angelina Jolie, just to name a few. Uh, she's also the, been the voice of Pardon the Interruption on ESPN, if you know that amazing show, as well as the NFL Draft um, and uh, has appeared on camera in several comedy soap operas and TV shows. But her true passion is voice acting. And we're going to talk about some of her charitable um, her charitable uh, contributions and things that she's working on and the passions that she has with that as well. So without any further ado, everybody, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our special guest this evening, Kat Cressida. Kat, welcome. Hello. <laughs> I don't know if you saw me. I was like, oh, I should get one of the Funko Pops. And I raced off and then I heard you without further ado. And I was like, well, that's going to look sucky if he puts me on and I'm not there. So Hello. <laughs> Hello. No, you're all good. I actually was just thinking about that. I thought when you said, could you see me? I couldn't because I had the, the Zoom window was behind my stream window. What I really need is another monitor. So that's something I need to put on. <laughs> I need to put on the Christmas list because then I would have been able to see you. So anyway, it's all good. Um, but yeah, so you have the Funko Pop uh, there. The one that is in the uh, is going to be uh, one of the featured items in the uh, in the signing that you're doing here pretty soon. 
I do, but it's in the other room. That's why. That's yeah. why I like they dove back into my chair when I heard you. You know the final announcement. So. <laughs> it's all good. Well, but. yeah. So everybody's saying hi to you in the chat. Welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> so did you? I can I can put it back on me for a minute. Do you want to grab it so we can talk about designing? It's up to you. Yeah, yeah. Here, I'll that, put it back. On, I'll put it back on me yeah. for a second. There we go. Okay. So now you're seeing me for a second. She's going to run and go grab that. And then when she's back, uh, then I will, uh, I'll bring her in. And, but we want to talk about a special event she's doing here in just a couple weeks. If you're in Southern California, it's a huge opportunity for anybody who's a huge Disney fan and wants to, uh, make a difference for charity, but also, uh, meet and greet and get to talk to Kat. Uh, and she's going to also talk about another special guest that's going to be there as well, uh, at this event that you'll get to meet as well. If you're in California and you want to, you're interested in going to this event. So um, definitely. And she's, we'll also talk about other ways you can help. Of course, not everybody's in Southern California. So if you're not there, uh, there's other ways that you can help as well. And we will talk about that here in just a second. So, all righty. But yeah, this is, um, it's a really cool event and opportunity uh, at a very high end uh, collecting uh, collecting uh, place or collecting store or shop, I guess is what you want to say. It looks like she is back with the, uh, with the Funko Pops. Let me bring that up here real quick. And there you go. <laughs> awesome. QVC, just my own little QVC commercial. Not really. <laughs> that is so cool. And so, um, yeah, that's right. Dave says cats into his house. That's right. That's Dave's thing. That's what he says. But you've been, actually, Dave re retweets a lot of your stuff. If you remember Road Trip Dave on Twitter. Oh, I love Road Trip stuff. Dave. Shout out, <laughs> shout out to all of my homies out there. I heard you mention a few of them who do these amazing, yeah. you know, what I call QRTs, which we always retweet uh, at the end of the day. To give shout out, that's our way of making sure that my my followers see how awesome what you guys write about my Disney history is. So I love those comments. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you to anybody. And if you're on Twitter, by the way, while we're while we're on that topic, if you're on Twitter and you would like to, um, you know, she does tag certain people every day, but that doesn't mean that, that you know, you can't get in on the fun. All you have to do is oh, just yeah. have a Twitter account and uh, go in there and do a quote retweet, which uh, if you don't know, when you hit the retweet, you get the one option just to straight up retweet it. And it doesn't it doesn't add anything to it. But the quote retweet is best because it adds your own little spin on it and it allows you to. Um, it allows you to um, you know be a little bit more personal with it, and you can share that. And the reason, in fact, Kat, if you want to talk a little bit more real quick about um, what you're doing with your social media and what you hope to do with it to help out some of your favorite charities. Yeah, absolutely. I am going to see if I can. I... Oh, I think it froze. Hold on, guys. Let me see. I'm going to put it on me for a second. I think it froze. We lost her. She she went back to the beyond. <laughs> it's okay. If she calls me, I'll get it back. You know, technology is such a wonderful and thing. A huge, yeah. And a huge Disney connection, which is that um, Jeff Bridges, the amazing uh, Academy Award winning actor, uh, of course, Flynn in Tron, for those of you who are Tron fans, started this incredible charity probably about 18 years ago. And um, I remember when he first started it because he was putting out there on the internet way before social media, a big sign that said no kid hungry. Yeah. And what it does is any child who goes to um, school anywhere in the United States uh, gets a, a free hot lunch, guaranteed hot lunch so that they can, you know, do well in their studies and better their future, better our futures. Cause that's the big thing. Of course. The kids are our future. And if we don't take care of them when they're in school, we're, we're basically, I hate to say this, but we're screwing ourselves if we're right. not taking care of, you know, younger generations. And I love the fact that this basically supports any kid who goes to school. It encourages kids to go to school. They also get snacks um, throughout the day. And then they get once a week, a big box of food from their local food bank. Um, again, completely sponsored by this charity to bring home to their families, to ensure that their siblings and, you know, the whole family also gets, uh, you know, food throughout the week. So it touches my heart. I also do a lot of things with the Pediatric Cancer Society. And um, I think I mentioned this to you, Josh, I'm really honored to now be doing some keynote speaking for um, kids with disabilities. Any Anybody who's gone through oh, yeah. serious illness and is looking towards their future. There's a lot of colleges now, thank God, around the United States with programs specifically to support those with any kind of disabilities, whether it's slight hearing loss, um, you know, significant dyslexia, any kind of learning disability, and um, physical disabilities as well. So um, I'm doing one in three weeks. I've been 
like can't sleep because I'm just writing notes all the time about what am I going to say to these, to the graduating class? Oh, absolutely. College. So yeah. It, I, I, excellent. Well, we had a little bit, by the way, I, I don't know if you heard me. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical glitch where we lost you and it froze. And then, so we missed a little bit of the beginning of that. It came back when you were talking about Jeff Bridges. It said your bandwidth was low, but you're good to go now. It was just a little technical glitch there. That was me. That was me improving the connection. Oh, so hopefully it. it won't happen again. Okay. No, you're uh, good. I think all that I said was, yes, I, my favorite charity throughout COVID. Okay, cool. Been, and, and Jeff Bridges, and you know him as Flynn from Tron, of course. Right. As, as well as a million other things. I'm sure that probably kind of annoys him if that's the only thing that we know him about. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, doing, he's done he's so many great things. Course. Yes. Yeah. He absolutely has. Well, so um, we wanted to, um, so we want to talk about that. So guys, the best thing that you can do actually to, to help and support in those uh, endeavors that she was just talking about is if you want to go ahead and uh, follow her at Kat Cressida on Twitter and Moppers, if you can post that in the chat for us so people can just click on it, go over there if you have a Twitter or even, you know, create a Twitter, you don't have to put a picture or anything on it. You can be totally anonymous, uh, but go on there and uh, follow her on Twitter and uh, you can share out her post. She posts all these really well edited videos. She was telling me the other night how um, how much time that, that she spends on getting all this stuff edited and gathered. It's really great stuff. Hours. So yeah, literally hours. <laughs> so definitely go check it out. It's not, this is not something where it's like, you know, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm just going over there to be nice. Of course you are, but at the same time, you're going to really enjoy it because you're all Disney fans or you wouldn't be here. So at least not on our channel here because we're mostly about Disney. So Go check that out. Follow at Cat Cressida on Twitter. Also, you can follow her on Instagram. It's the same thing, Cat Cressida on Instagram. And uh, yeah, go check that out, guys. I think uh, I know uh, she would appreciate it as well as the charities that she's supporting. And the reason that that helps, um, and you're so awesome to say that, Josh, is because once I hit every, every time I hit a certain landmark in terms of followers, I get to the next tier with the American Cancer Society in terms of more abilities to use my journey and what I've been through to help others. So I get, you kind of go from tiny influencer to small influencer to medium influencer. And as you, you know, unfortunately with uh, illnesses being so prevalent in this day and age, there's a lot of celebrities and influencers and reality TV, star, you know, stars who are out there. So they basically, they try to keep it very democratic. And when I hit a certain level of followers, I get sponsoring for the next level to do more, um, to do more good. And my, my focus is pediatric cancer, children, teenagers, uh, college students who are battling um, any diagnosis. So that's why the followers help. Yes, absolutely. And it's a, it's, a, it's a huge thing because obviously, as we all know, it does take time to grow a following. So anything we can do to help with that as a community, we would appreciate. And I know she would as well. So thank you guys. We appreciate that. And now let me... Yeah. Uh, let me move on to um, the, this the weekend's event. Yes, the fun part. Yeah. So this weekend's event, um, is, or not this week, I'm sorry, this weekend. It's in a couple weeks, actually, the the, the event that we're talking about tonight. Uh, and if you can see, when I had Kat up just a second ago, you could see I, I talked about a special event where you can meet and greet her um, at a very special signing coming up. Um, so if we, uh, before we get into all the questions and interview questions, if you want to tell us about that special event and how people can join you for that. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. So how's, by the way, to everybody out there, if, if they, anybody, how is the camera looking? Because this is a brand new computer and I want to make sure you guys are seeing clearly and that there's no issues. Yeah, well, is I, I was going to say on my end, it looks fantastic, which means okay, that it's going to go out to the stream pretty well also. And I've got you full screen now. So I think it looks good. I'll, I'll wait for people in the chat. It takes about 20 seconds for them to catch up. So yeah, but go ahead. Okay. All right, cool. So basically, um, this awesome event, I am so honored to be a part of. It's at Chalice Collectibles. This is my very first y'all in store signing. <laughs> this is a big thing now with Funko Pops, of course. Um, I've got two of them sitting around here. But uh, there's also a few Jessies that they were able to pull in some Jessie the Cowgirls from the Toy Story 4 release and a ton of Dee Dee's, which is not Disney, but it's still fun animation from Dexter's Laboratory. And basically, I will be live in the store all day. They're saying is it's from 11 a.m. till last fan standing, which sounds like it could go a very long time. Wow. Um, and they, they've got such a, a preview um so many people have responded that they're showing up that they're now actually sending out um you know if it's important to you you can write them directly and say i want to reserve a place in line how do i do that 
because apparently um, it's in a very upscale shopping situation out in Arcadia. Okay. I think it's past Pasadena is what I've been told. So it's about 30 minutes from where I live, 30 minutes from Disney Studios or 25. And um, and it's a big, gorgeous, it's their flagship store, Chalice Collectibles. You can follow them on Instagram if you're into pops or collectibles, all kinds of collectibles, not just um, not just Funko Pops. They also have comics and uh, I can't name all of the things that are so relevant today, but I'm going to be in store live. I'm going to have exclusive Haunted Mansion merchandise that is certain, uh, some certain Imagineer friends have created for me, exclusive for the event that I'll be signing. I'll have some eight by tens of, you know, the characters that I'm honored to do and voice. And I'm joined by a huge voiceover talent. He's also huge in anime, Todd Habercorn. So it's just the two of us, your own little private fan convention. And it's going to be incredible. And the artwork they've already started posting on their various chalice Instagrams. And I think we have the link there for you guys also in the, um, in the YouTube yes, profile. We do. Uh, now, can you tell us, um, I know it's in the link too, but, uh, and you may have already mentioned it. People were asking in the chat about the date and you said the time, what was the date one more time? Yeah. Thank you. So it's April 30th, which I can't believe how fast it's coming up next week. I'm actually going to be in Vegas. Y'all Vegas baby or um, <laughs> fanboy expo. I think it is. And uh, and then the following weekend, April 30th, which is a Saturday, I'm told they've got a parking lot right near their store, which makes it really nice. And what's so special about the store? I have to give a shout out to them because I I appreciate pops. I respect them. I think they're adorable. I mean, come on, they're freaking adorable. But I'm not a huge collector. I'm not an avid collector the way so many awesome people are and Disney fans are. And I can't believe the number of Disney just exclusive Disney Funko Pop accounts there are now. And Chalice started in 2017. So they were right there as it was getting huge. And it's three partners. And they are so respected by the actual brand Funko Pop. They've had over 20 exclusives at this point. And if you don't know what that is, that basically means that they do they do such high performance and they do such high-end VIP events like the signing we're doing in two weeks that Funko designated them as being the first release, designated first release. So they get Funkos way ahead. Um, and sometimes only, they're the only ones to get certain exclusive Funkos, like they had a, a Star Wars exclusive a few months ago. That's amazing. So that's thing. Yeah. That's awesome. They're like the Disney of Funko Pops. Oh, no, I just got lawsuit. But, yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. So uh, moderators just posted the link. It's also in the chat, uh, in the description of the video and what it pulls up. And I don't have it. I, I can't show you right now because of the, the way the, uh, the stream works, but you can pull it up on your own device. And there's a, it pulls up to a Chalice uh, Instagram post and uh, it just talks about Chalice Santa Anita is proud to announce a special double signing, just like she was talking about. Uh, Westfield Santa Anita, Mall, Santa Anita Mall on Saturday, April 30th, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, it talks about um, Kat's, uh, her credits, and then Todd's credits, what he's worked on as well. And then it talks about some of the pricing and things like that. So uh, so some great a great opportunity here. And um, definitely, it I'm sorry? Oh, there you go. Look, perfect. Now we can see <laughs> it. I got you. So let's do it one more time. I just switched back over. Oh, okay. You see it? Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. So... Now, did you mention, you mentioned that, that some of the proceeds of this, a portion of them would be going to charity? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that was sort of my thing during COVID was it, it just felt wrong to be doing giveaways or to be going to fan conventions and talking about them while so many people were, you know, struggling with real world issues. I mean, myself included, I have family members who also fell ill. So my way of sort of offsetting that guilt and also sense of well-being and balance. Okay, I'm going to fly to Orlando. I'm going to sign all weekend. We're going to do high class problems like my plane is running behind, but I'll donate half of what I make at this convention to to these charities. So, and then I did that thing with give, that awesome event with Give Kids the World last year as well, flying uh, last September to their, um, the Diz family reunion thing. So that's pretty much what I do. Any fan convention I go to, if, if I'm lucky enough to meet any of you live at any point or you fly out anywhere that I am, you know that half of what I am making at that, at least half is going. But for this event in particular, pretty much 90% of the proceeds are going to um, No Kid Hungry from this event coming up. So I'm super excited because 
Chalice said that they get huge turnouts and that we're going to have a big, you know, a big amount of people enjoying and, and playing with the pops and everything. And then I'm doing a private signing for them on Sunday, which means that I'm going to autograph a bunch of pops for them that they can then, you know, resell to people who couldn't make it. So all of that, oh, that's, 90%. That's, that's so amazing. I, I, I'm really excited and I hope it, I obviously hope it goes really well. And uh, I think that people will be really, really interested to, to hear how it goes too. And I'm sure you guys will, uh, if you can post on, I don't know if you can post on social media about it at all, but I think uh, after the fact, but I'm, I'm sure it'll be great to, to hear how it goes. And hopefully a lot is raised for that. Yeah, and I have a little special extra thing that I didn't share with you, Josh, but I came up with my social media gal. Anybody who's willing, any Disney fan who's willing, particularly if you're in Southern California, because that's where this is, but even if you're not, if you're willing to post this image that they created on your main feed, meaning on your actual, you know, little IG squares with a description of the event, I will send you a sign eight by 10 FedEx from wow. me as a thank you for helping promote this because I really want to bring in the income for this charity. It's like, it's going to be my one big event before September to raise, you know, drive to raise as much as I possibly can. So thanks you guys. Absolutely. You let Josh know about that. If you want, you know, to be connected with this image, you have to post it within the next 48 hours because the event is coming up soon. So there's my caveat. You can't say, yes, I'm going to do it and then not do it. You have to post in 48 hours and then I will send you a sign eight by 10 of the bride. Yay. Excellent. Yeah. So if you do that uh, and you want to uh, either make sure you tag cat and then, and then her people will definitely see that you did that, or you can even send it to me and I'll make sure uh, that, that I send it to her, her people as well. They they can get that. So that's not a problem. That'll be great. Um, yeah. And um, also, um, so th I think that's, that's, um, that's it on the big event. That was really, really uh Really awesome to, to hear how that goes. And, and hopefully some of you guys, if you're around in the area, um, you know, definitely go and support that if you can. But also, even if you can't be there, again, like she just said, you can support by by sharing the image and by sharing and also quote retweeting any of the posts that she does on her accounts of those things as well. So those are things that are all appreciated, I know. So definitely. Um, now for the really fun stuff. Let's talk about Hollywood. Yes. I had a break in the voiceover. I heard, I heard as I was like, saying, I'm here, I'm here, I heard people talking about, and then you mentioned something about cast member, and I was gonna jump in and say, speaking of cast members, former cast members. Yes. I always, I always keep this to show everybody, to prove that I earned my pedigree. That is so cool. And if you don't know what that is about, we, we did talk about that on the last interview, but for anybody who missed that, um, she did work on the Storybook Canal Boats at Disneyland, which is amazing. Yeah, cast member. So. so so yeah. yes so let me start out here because uh, that was something we had a, a few things that people were wanting to know about and some great questions that were asked uh here so um the the first thing is um let me see here this is one that that kind of um you know i was thinking about especially based on our conversations recently uh you've done work in so many different genres and and um you know, let's, I guess it'd be interesting because especially for people that are thinking about getting into it, um, I'd love to hear about some of the differences in those genres. So uh, most of our viewers, of course, know you for being the Haunted Mansion Bride. Uh, so what would be the difference in like doing the voiceover work uh, and, and some of the, even some of the video that you did for the Haunted Mansion Bride uh, and then recording something like a TV series for Dexter's Laboratory? Like what's the difference between doing those two different yeah. types of genres? So um, voiceover as it stands now, the voiceover universe is very broad, very wide, and that it's definitely true that you can't do all of it. Um, I mean, you can be capable of doing all of it, but it's just like anything else, any career, you gotta kind of pick a lane to excel at, to break into, to be known in. And it was very different 20 years ago when voiceover was much more behind the scenes. Um, as I've often shared on many podcasts and interviews, Toy Story, the first Toy Story in the 90s really changed that conversation because once Tom Hanks uh, was cast as Woody and once he stuck as Woody, because they always, when they're in development, they'll try a few different voices. They really will to see what suits the character best. And I got to really hand it to Disney and Pixar, uh, apart from other brands that I won't name, studios, but they really do 
and always have worked to find the best voice. They don't go for the biggest A-list celebrity, if you think about it. They go for the voice that they feel is going to be the best suited. Sometimes it's somebody from Disney Broadway or Disney Broadway show, from, especially from the earlier uh, animated features during the Renaissance, I should say. And Pixar, you know, always goes for interesting character voices, uh, the best actor or actress to suit it. I'm not supposed to say actress, in, in, by the way, but since I broke in and we were using actress when I broke in in the 90s, I still sometimes default to that. Sorry, actor. We're all actors. Um, and anyway, once Toy Story happened and at the time when Tom Hanks was first cast, of course, you know, uh, he wasn't the A-list celebrity. He wasn't the Oscar winning huge celebrity that we now know him as with so many amazing roles behind him and on his resume. He had uh, broken out of Bosom Buddies, that awesome sitcom that I watched. Oh, yeah. When I was <laughs> and he was um, very much uh, doing those like comedies and bachelor, bachelor party and volunteers. Anyway, that's where he was in his career. And then ironically, just as Toy Story came out, he started getting those bigger roles. So suddenly this A-list celebrity who was a leading man, Splash, um, basically was voicing you know, a Pixar feature. And that just was serendipity, good thinking on their part. He was brilliant at the role, of course. And that changed the conversation because once Tom Hanks' name was associated with a Disney animated feature, now every A-list celebrity was fine to be considered. And again, they weren't necessarily cast. It's fun to see, I get to see sometimes the who was considered, who was sort of um, on callback for some of these iconic Disney princesses and princes and leads. And it's mind blowing and you're like, really? God, what would that have been like? They, they cast the perfect voice. But it's funny to think that Brad Pitt could have been a voice. Of, right. I can't say Brad, but right. it's, it's really amazing. So you're saying and, they, they passed on uh, A-list celebrities be, because they were they were wanting to get the perfect sound. The, the perfect voice yeah. for the character. Wow. Yeah. Um, and to answer your question, um, in terms of, um, it, is it okay, by the way, that we're, I don't want it to be distracting with the camera. Do you, are we good right now with how it is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. that's great. Doing a weird flashy thing on my end, but it's probably because I've got this new sensitive equipment that I haven't figured out how to use yet. No, it, it, there's, I don't see that at all on my end. Okay, great. Great. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure it's pleasant, a pleasant viewing experience for you guys. The picture in the background uh, is very nice. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so um, in voiceover, there are, in no particular order, commercial voiceover, promo announced voice, voiceover, live announced voiceover, Political voiceover. Um, there is looping, ADR looping, which I've been on to do a lot for movies where the voice matching comes into play. There's video games, there's audio books, there's straight narration, and then there's a whole bunch of subcategories. Um, anime does fall into the dubbing category. Sorry, it's not it's not considered animation voiceover, it's considered anime voiceover and dubbing, um, because it is. And uh then there's a whole bunch of other subcategories. So again, people sort of break in somewhere. It is possible to do crossover and to maintain that crossover, but you kind of are lucky if you really are making it in two or three categories. It's really hard to do all of them at once and be known and maintain that level of um, sort of notoriety and being known for within those. There's some exceptions, definitely people who've broken outside. Oh, I forgot to say trailer trailers. That's a whole oh, other yeah. category in and of itself. So, and the reason that that is, it's not so much talent, although that can, you know, some people's talent are geared towards particular parts of that world. It's also because of the, the amount of commitment and technology one needs to be up on uh, to do those. So for example, uh, not that one can ever decide where they're going to break in because that's there's a lot of luck involved and a lot of timing, but, Let's say I said, I want to be a trailer voice gal. I want to just do trailer voices and really focus on that. Now, there's a lot more possibilities for that these days than there were when I broke in 20 years ago. Uh, of course, the voice of God, that famous Don LaFontaine in the world, um, you know, this, this yes. Halloween, those trailer voice people, there's probably about these days, there's probably about 30 to 50 guys who really specialize in it. That's what they do. 
That's amazing. And they do trailers, of course, for streaming, for, for all of the uh, you know streaming platforms, for t- television promos, and uh, sorry, television trailers and theatrical trailers. Um, of course, they took a bit of a hit during COVID when theaters were struggling. Right. But they're back now in full force. And they have to be available, y'all, 24-7. Because if the studio decides that a marketing campaign is not going as well as it was supposed to, they will literally rejigger it at 11 at night. And you have to be prepared, kind of like a doctor, but not nearly as important to people's health. Sorry, trailer voice guys. Um, <laughs> but you have to be prepared to jump in your booth if you're the voice of that campaign and do it. And you sign on for that. When you accept a campaign, and who wouldn't say, Yes, I'll be the voice of the next Mission Impossible feature or the next Pixar animated. You know, of course, you're going to say yes. Um, They don't care if you're on vacation. They don't care if it's your son's wedding. They don't care. You have to be available. And therefore, you have to have a full home studio with all the capabilities. You have to be able to record to picture. Sometimes you have to actually time your narration and your reads to picture. And you have to have all that technology. So... Hopefully that didn't scare that one person out there who's determined they're going to be the next big trailer voice, but it's a lot uh, in that field. If you do promos, which I'm honored to do some of, I just I just did one, can I say it? Of course. No, I can't, I can't say what I just did. Oh, I'm so excited. So I'm an ongoing voice for Stars, Stars Encore, Encore Stars, Stars Network. So they have a huge, huge original movie coming out in two weeks no in a week in a week and i just recorded some trailer some radio trailers and promos for it and i'm so excited i can't say what it is though because it drops monday Uh, so on monday (laughs) if you hear that that'll be me oh that's awesome it's got huge a-list celebrities in it have i hinted enough if anybody shouts it out i'll nod (laughs) that's awesome well um there we go yeah so you can be looking for that on stars here um, in the next, uh, I guess by Monday, that's pretty awesome. So um, I think, yeah, that kind of leads us into, um, you know, all the different types of, of voicing that, that, that there are. I mean, that's, it's, it's really amazing that, I mean, like you, it makes all make sense when, when I hear you talk about it, but obviously it's not something that the average person really thinks of that it's split into those genres, but it definitely is. And, and so if somebody, I guess then a follow up to that is, you know, uh, somebody asked in the chat before the stream, um, yeah. if somebody's wanting to get into voice acting or, or, or on camera acting, either one, like what would be your first advice? What should they do first, um, to just to get started, to really tap their toe in the water and see what's going on? Okay. That's a great question. And it's a little bit of a chicken in the egg. And I promised when we were sort of hashing out what we would talk about tonight, and we had a very thorough conversation about how to make this the most worthwhile Easter weekend experience for you all who were gracious enough to tune in. And thank you again for being here. Um, and obviously for following Resort TV. Um, it's it's one of those questions where in a sense, you go intuitively with what you are thinking you want to do in voiceover. And I know at least 10 years ago, everybody said, oh, I'm really, you know, I would love to do animation. That seems so much fun or video games. That seems so much fun. And it is fun. There's no doubt about it. And it certainly beats some of the other things, you know, that I had a choice of doing when I graduated from UC Berkeley. But um, sorry, UC Berkeley. <laughs> I love my alma mater, but I was gearing towards a much more professional, you know, maybe it was going to be a, a writer for, you know, basically doing a lot of journalism. I was maybe going to be doing at law school. That was one of the things that I was in pre, pre-law for. But if you want to do anything that character based video games animation um anime you're going to want to take obviously acting classes and not just high school acting or even college classes you're going to want to take a few professional acting classes and there pretty much are i think in every town you know known academies known places where you can study the craft and that is because uh, acting and in particular voiceover is really about being very, very present in the moment. You have to be really sharp on the fact that right there in the moment, you have to be completely pliable, vulnerable, 
accessible to all of that amazing, we call it the treasure chest of emotions, the tool, your toolbox of emotions, so that someone throws something at you or the script throws something at you or demands something of you, you have access to that emotion immediately, believably and authentically. And if you think about it, all the great actors that you probably love, unless you're just into their looks, which is totally fine. Um, I've got a few of those, but you know, the really fantastic actors that, that are riveting uh, on the screen and in voice acting, you believe them. You buy what situation they're in. You're 100% in the moment with them. And that's because they're 100% in the moment with their emotions and their responses. Um, one of the reasons just to pick out one of a million, Tom Holland, who I have an inappropriate crush on, inappropriate because he's 20 years younger than me. <laughs> um, but, you know, who doesn't? Uh, what what made him so exceptional in that role, um, and by the way, I if someone asked me who would I prefer to do the next, spy, you know, who's my favorite Peter Parker, I'm sorry, it is Andrew Garfield. He's an amazing talent, and he was, you know, who I grew up with, so he's my first choice. Um, but Tom Holland is an exceptional young actor. He, you believe him, you believe his vulnerability, you believe the moments, the beats that he goes through um, on his journey, you totally buy that he's the, you know, ideal Peter Parker in his humility, his vulnerability, his eagerness to do good. Um, I haven't met one person, whether or not they like Spider-Man or not, and there are a few people who are like, you yeah, know, it's fine, it's it's cute. Um, but you buy him and you buy what he what, what's going on for him. So to answer that question, if you're considering voice acting, being present is crucial because you are literally, the skill set is that you pick up a piece of paper, put it on a music stand, and without having had any rehearsal, you're literally pulling those words off the page and hopefully the listener buys that you're in those motions and that you're reacting or responding. When you do video games, um, you literally walk in for a four hour session that you're gonna be on your feet for. Is this, am I in the right? Direction, by the way, it's like silence here. I can't, Chris, can't hear you. Amazing people, oh, this is yeah. answering people's questions. No, absolutely. People, I think, are just taking it all in right now. I was looking at the chat, and everybody's pretty much just saying hi, or they agree, or they, they you know, really just everybody. I think is just sitting back and taking okay. it all in. So you're, you're great uh, with the answers there. I appreciate okay. that. Yeah. I don't want to just be like a talking head that's going on. People are like, whatever. Well, but, I, yeah, I was gonna say I could put myself up next to you, but I'm just gonna be nodding, so that's probably not that interesting. <laughs> okay. you know, um, I mean, these are the questions I get asked all the time. You know, thirty times a week on DMs and and on my Instagram. Oh no, so okay. Now they say doing great, cat. Yep, please keep going. Okay, yeah, I love okay, it. Oh, there okay. we go. All right, right. <laughs> so when you walk into a video game session, all that you're told is a fake title. They don't tell you what you're actually there for. You sign an NDA that says, if you, you know, whatever you do today, you will not discuss social media about, you will not share, reveal, da, 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 or we'll kill you and you'll never be part of this game again. Right. Uh, and they have replaced people, by the way. That does happen where if somebody does, not so much anymore because you know, people have learned, but if you do go on your social media and talk about something before you've been given the go-ahead from the gaming company, they will replace you. Um, they don't want that that kind of leak in the video game world. Of course. And interestingly enough, there's far less leaks in the video game world than there are in um, on camera, even though you would think the consequences would be far more serious in on camera. But regardless, right. walk in and it's four hours of literally line by line by line by line of your responses and call outs and shout outs and efforts. And they'll have a little emotion next to it or a little situation at the far left um, and then you'll literally go down this crazy scrolling menu of reading your emotion. The director you know, gives his three, three seconds of input and then doing that line, you'll give an A, B and a C. Uh, that means you'll do the line three times, three different ways with a different spin each line. And then for a moment, the director will confer with the, the client, which is the gaming company that's always listening in or live in person, uh, pre and post COVID, that, that is what happened. They fly out to be there live in the room and they'll decide which line will be the, the final winner for the video game. And they do that in the moment so that they don't leave a session with literally 500 lines to go through. So they'll do it, you know, line by line. And you just quickly, you go through rapid fire, A, B and a C of each line. You have to have 
stamina. You have to know how to quickly manipulate your emotions. And oftentimes they'll say, okay, cat, we need, you know, almost be choking through your tears through that line. And you need to instantly do that and sound like you are in the moment, almost in tears, unable to get the words out. That's what's expected of, of voiceover and animation voice talent. It's literally like flipping a switch, right? You just have to flip the switch and there you go. Or flipping a switch to me almost feels, you're not wrong. Right. But the way I think of it is I have to immediately access that. Access, I just have to be yeah. present for it um, so that it doesn't feel artificial so that you buy that that character is in that moment. And video games have become so high end oh, yeah. with such high expectations on the voice talent that if you're not really present in the moment for it, people tune out. They don't buy you as a character. They don't follow your character and you could get sort of weeded out if if you're not you know really strong in that performance. So that's to answer the question, if you wanted to do that, first and foremost, some professional acting classes. And then of course, whatever you want to do in voiceover, commercial, promo, announcing, take a good workshop. And pretty much in every major city, there's a casting director local to that city or a great engineering um, a studio, engineering studio, where you can take classes from working professionals who know, you know what to look for in great voice talent. Uh, you you want it to be with a profession, obviously someone who does this, preferably casting director, because they know what they're listening for when they cast voices. So they're great to sign up for. Here in California, I'll just throw out a few in no particular order. Uh, Terry Berlin casting, um, the voice casters, um, voice, uh, what is it, voiceover West? No, voice chasers West, something voice, voice tracks, voice tracks West. Um, those are three great places. Carol Kimball, Carol Casting does amazing. Uh, that's who I trained with to break into commercials. So you want to train anywhere in the United States, you can probably find a great casting house, sign up for a voiceover class and see if you even like it, because I swear to you, it's not like everything else. It's probably not what you think it was unless you're already doing radio broadcasting and have done that professionally or professional singing and recording or jingle recording it's not going to feel or or seem how you how your mind envisioned it when you were picturing doing that for a living so that's the best advice i can give you that's awesome and i want to i want to um like going along with that actually on the video game aspect we've got a uh, a german voice actor in the chat here he says he's a german voice actor Thank you. Frankie the Voice is his name, and he says, here in Germany, I have the advantage that I hear the English voice beforehand and then speak my text based on the template and computer games. So he kind of takes that emotion in the English text and that performance and then does the German version of it. That's that's actually pretty cool. I actually just had to do that for a famous um, Japanese anime game um, that's already out now, Exos. Exos, E-X-O-S, so I can say it. I can say I did it because it's already out and yeah. announced. And it's a very big anime-based anime, uh, anime -based video game uh, all over Asia. And I had to do exactly what you're saying, Mr. Fabulous German voiceover person. I literally had to go through line by line and hear how they delivered it in their native tongue and then do my best to sort of approximate that in English, which, of course, it's almost that humorous thing in in eight sometimes in the asian languages <laughs> something that literally on my script will say hey you and and the the dub the, the actual original voice goes on for like a minute and you're like <laughs> that's hey you and apparently yes it's a lot more words yeah it's like okay i, I don't i'm not gonna make it there's no way to make that last that long <laughs> yeah so that's uh it's a lot of fun when that happens. You try not to laugh too much throughout that because clearly that's their language and that's how they communicate. But um, but yes, thank you for joining and thank you for adding that. That falls into the anime dubbing side. It used to be in the old days and there's like the vengeance. We call it the revenge of the anime talent because in the old days, uh, that's how most of us broke in was you would get a, a very, anime does not pay to do it professionally um, unless it's like, um, Unless it's a it's an American based anime, which there are some now, and of course Avatar, Airbender, that was one of the first sort of look looks anime, but it's not right. Um, but um, anime itself, you're dubbing, 
it's literally a dubbing contract, a union dubbing contract, which means you're getting paid by the hour and not very much, no residuals. Wow. You, you don't get anything else for doing it. Um, and that, that went on for years. It's how I broke in as well, because that's how you learn how to do different voices and learn ADR voice matching and just get better at your tool, you know, your toolbox of emotions. Um, all of us sort of started there or a lot of us started there and then would break into animation, legit animation, you know, union animation. And it, that's still how it's done. But now of course, anime is so huge that you can go for fan conventions forever and make serious bank every weekend. So it offsets it. So those voice talent are now almost more in demand than a lot of us animation voice talent because anime is so huge. So, and certainly in like in the Funko Pop world, you know, they're having a huge season with all of the drops that are going on with anime characters. So good for them because they're not making the kind of money that union animation contracts make, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, and now it's gotten harder to break into, of course, because now once, er once everybody's like, oh, I want to sign at fan conventions, well, you have to be an anime character. How do you be an anime character? You have to get cast in a, right. in a series. So now a lot of people are vying for that. But go if that's your dream, I never discourage. I, I really think anybody can do it if you're willing to do the work. And I, I hate to break it to you, but there is no magic pill. It is a lot of hard work. Right. Well, I think, you know, the thing I, I can, I would compare it to, too, is, you know, as a, as a musician, you know, I wasn't, you know, I didn't just all of a sudden start playing saxophone and I just could do it. Like, obviously you have to work on it. You have to study with the best people. You know, you have to find, you know, places to kind of use your, you know, talent. It's, it's, it's different in a lot of ways, but as far as learning to do it, I think a lot of people, um, you know, don't realize how much professional training that actors have even even your you know even your people that you see in the movies and on the oscars all the time i'm assuming and you can answer this maybe but way better than i can but i'm assuming all these people and i put professional musicians in that as well up to the best of the best they've all been trained very very well i mean would you say even the a-list celebrities they've all had lots of training correct i mean you, you said that beautifully yes it's a lot of training i I'm trying to think through A-list. I mean, there are some A-list celebrities who um, they had training, they paid their dues, that's for sure. But some of them, interestingly enough, of course, came from the comedy world and that's hard, very hard training too. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to make a living as a stand-up comedian will oh, tell yeah. you that is grinding it out. That yes. is um, not easy work. And of course, everybody, Robin Williams, Jerry Seinfeld, um, Try to think of all of the big, you know, every sitcom that was breaking out in the 90s and the early 2000s, George Lewis, all of them started on the comedy circuit as almost as teenagers uh, from the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, busing, you know, they to, to get a spot on stage. I don't know if you guys know this, and it's probably changed a little bit because, of course, labor laws and all that. But back in the day, back in the, when um, sitcoms were, you know, signing up, um, TV stars, you know, all over the place from the comedy circuit. And I'm, you know, again, Julie Louis-Dreyfus and uh, Jason Alexander and um, all, all of them who had their own sitcom. Ellen, all of them who had their own sitcom started on the comedy circuit. Right. And the way that you would get on stage, the way that you would actually earn your place on stage was busing at wow. the local comedy shop, unless you were exceptionally talented and had made it up, you know, through like the Midwest or established yourself in Chicago. But again, to get a spot on stage uh, at amateur night or beginner's night or first tier night or whatever they would call it, you had to pay your dues by bussing tables and learning from the inside out how hard it was to be up on that stage, competing against the noise. Um, you learn the tricks of the trade by watching the masters, hanging out in the wings, working 11 hour shifts, Right. you pay your dues. So to answer your question, there are of course some A-list celebrities who came from the comedy circuit, um, but that's its own kind of training. And right. trying to get a laugh out of an audience that's drunk beyond or drugged out or just there for a hot date. I mean, you're competing against human nature. Right. And people are rude, people don't care that this is your big break up on stage, your first time getting main stage, it's ruthless. Oh yeah. So um, 
whatever road you choose to take to make to make a living that's that's the term i use if, if your choice is if your thought is i want to make a living at this know that it's going to be a lot of training whatever that road is and a lot of dues paying unless and i i joke about this all the time no disrespect but i think they would agree with me if you're you know if you were lucky enough to be spielberg's daughter or ron howard's daughter right. or you know fill in the blank francis Ford, Ford coppola's daughter you're still going to pay your dues nobody's going to give you an instant a-list celebrity oscar card but you have it a lot easier you're gonna get a break you're, you're gonna get you're gonna get a break yeah. and if you're halfway good you may get a few because of name association people are like that you know oh we're gonna have ron howard's daughter in here for a callback everybody gets excited because you know I, right right is it dallas bryce howard or bryce i'm so sorry i always confuse her awesome name Anybody oh know? yeah i don't know in the chat let, let us know they know everything let, let us know in the chat what the right I, I don't dallas know so howard. Dallas Bryce Howard. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about, the beautiful redhead from Jurassic Park and, you know, subbed in in Twilight is Victoria. Right. So um, there I just proved that I actually watch Twilight movies. So um, if you're lucky enough to be there and halfway good, you probably are going to make it. Whether or not you continue to make it will depend on how much natural talent uh, you you bring to the table, but you will have it easier. Yeah. And there have been many times, many times I have recently thought, Man, it would have been so awesome to be Spielberg's daughter. <laughs> yeah, and they I said, probably, they said yeah. Bryce Bryce Dallas Howard. They said, thank you. And she's very talented. I mean, and she's beautiful. So um, you know, she kind of hit the lottery, and I think she would agree, which is why she's a humble, lovely actress to work with. Oh yeah, she she lucked out this time around on Earth. So. Absolutely. Um, and we have, uh, I just want to read this uh, comment here um, from uh, Frankie uh, in Germany. He says, I have the advantage that I hear the English voice beforehand, but he said, oh, here it is. I already read that one. Compared to, Amer <laughs> compared to America, dubbing voice actors are unknown in Germany. It's more of an invisible job still. Not many want to know the people behind the voice. That's interesting. Yes. Well, coming soon for you, Frankie. Yeah. I mean, anime's having a huge moment here, and if it if it starts in America, I'm pretty sure it's going to make it in two or three years. Hang in there because you're going to be huge on the fan convention circuit, and and maybe you know start to do some actual uh, original animation too. So absolutely, and um, so yeah, so I we have a, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna. I actually was gonna say. Um, um, based on, you know, talking about, you know, Hollywood and making it and all that stuff. And you talked about, you know, making a living. I think that's so important to talk about as far as Hollywood goes. Uh, and this is something I think we talked about beforehand. I think we didn't get to this on the last interview. Um, you, you mentioned, you mentioned paying your dues and all the things uh, that are so important, but also just in general, as an actor, what is it like in Hollywood, I mean, you see the TV, you see the portrayal on the movies, and of course it's glamorized or it's exaggerated or whatever, that it's cutthroat and all this, but what is it really like in Hollywood, at least your experience? <laughs> Talk about a loaded gun. Yeah, that's a question, uh, right? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, there's a few answers. There's a few different legitimate answers. So. What is LA like? I mean, I could flip my camera around right now and you can see my view. I mean, it's breathtaking in terms of like quality of life. It's not, is, is the word, it's not overrated. It's beautiful. A lot of time during the year, even though we've messed up the climate um, and we're having unseasonably cold nights right. and unseasonably hot days. I've heard that. Um, we'll literally have a span. It went down, we were joking the other day, it went from 39 degrees at night. 39 degrees, y'all. That is close to snow weather. That's, That's unheard cold. of in April. And then it shot up the next day to 92 degrees during the day. That is a huge differential. But regardless, it's a beautiful, Southern California is a beautiful place to live. And if you've ever been to Disneyland and driven anywhere other than Anaheim, um, you can vouch for that. We've got, you know, Arrowhead and Big Bear. I'm just like talking about quality of life first before I get into yeah. what's Hollywood like. But it plays into it, right? I mean, that's the the dream, the Southern California dream, the acting dream, the Hollywood dream. It is beautiful all the time. Um, it's just, you know, that's partly why the studios moved from New York originally back in the 20s and 30s and migrated out to Hollywood was they could shoot outside, you know, almost 365 right. and not worry about it impeding. That's how, 
That's why Hollywood's out here. It's because of the weather. If you've never thought about that or put the two together, that's why. Once it really was established as a, as a studio town. Well, it's time and is it's money. Why, if you're missing day shooting, that's money. So you've got to be out there. Yeah. Exactly. And the terrain is so variable that, that you, if they want to shoot, I, I joke about this, you know, Davy Crockett, when they were shooting that series, they weren't shooting it in Texas. They weren't shooting it where those locations really were. They were shooting it here in Los Angeles, in Southern California, but they were finding terrain that looked like, and that's what's amazing about Southern California. You can find almost, name it, you can find a terrain that looks like a sci-fi fantasy landscape, that looks like a deep mystical forest, Tokian forest, that looks like, you know, the backwoods of Tennessee, that looks like Malibu Beach, because we have Malibu Beach. You know, it, you can find the terrain you're looking for, and that's a huge reason why the studios are out here. So it makes it very nice to live here because on the weekend you can go, I'm out of here. I'm going to go skiing. <laughs> okay. You can do that almost, you know, 365. If you want to go, you know, out to the desert and have a peaceful spa oasis weekend, you could do that in uh, desert hot springs. If you want to go out to, you know, you know, have a beach weekend, go out, drive out San Monica or Malibu. That's what it's like to live here just in terms of the weather. And it's, so the way it's portrayed in the movies and TV is true. Uh, the traffic sucks. If you move out to Los Angeles, first of all, you have to know how to drive or you're going to be spending a ridiculous amount on Ubers or, you know, I don't, I mean, we do have taxi cabs, but you're going to spend forever. And I have had friends uh, or, or nieces and nephews of friends come out here and not know how to drive or not yet have a car. And I'm like, dude, you're in trouble. Because if you think you're going to Uber everywhere, you're going to go broke within two weeks. Wow. Um, yeah. You have to know how to drive and you have to have a car, um, preferably not a stick shift, which is how I, what I drove when I was a cast member driving on the five freeway every day. <laughs> Miserable. That's brave. Um, yeah. It's brave. stupid, but it's all I could afford. <laughs> right. So I had to get a crappy little stick shift. Um, in terms of what it's like people wise, um, as you can imagine, you can't really make it in Hollywood unless you have some amount of smarts, unless you're phenomenally gorgeous. I mean, I'm just gonna put that out there on the table, get it out of the way. If you are breathtakingly stunning and you won the genetic lottery, kudos to you, I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm appealing enough to certain people, which is why I did well in sitcoms in the early days, but, um, or, you know, the one cameras that I was honored to do, but, uh, pretty much unless you're drop dead gorgeous, you're going to have to have some amount of talent and smarts because it takes some amount of smarts to hang in there and to figure it out, to navigate your way, how to get your first on camera reel put together, how to, you know, get it edited, how to get it into the right hand. So it makes it to an agent, how to do an audition. It takes, you know, some amount of smarts. So it's not vapid. And it's not like that stereotype of everybody out in LA is like, you know, high or on drugs or, you know, whatever the various stereotypes I've heard um, when I travel around the country is everybody on drugs, is everybody like, you know, vapid and gorgeous. I'm like, no, <laughs> there's a lot of very smart people. Plus there's writers, directors, producers, uh, gaffers, sound editors. Right. I mean, there's a lot of people that make these things happen who live here in LA who are very bright and good at technology and all of that. So uh, people wise, you're gonna have a whole, you know, bronze, broad spectrum of uh, inter people to interact with. And you find your niche and you find your friends and you find your family and you find your group. That's what it's like in terms of the people. In terms of Hollywood, the industry, it is every stereotype, um, but the truism, I believe, is that triangle, that famous triangle, which Billions just, does anybody watch the show Billions? I freaking am addicted to it. I am heartbroken that it just had its season finale. I hadn't heard of that. What what uh, what what network or streaming service is that on? Uh, Showtime. Okay. Pretty sure it's Showtime. And it's um, freaking brilliant. And it stars uh, Corey, Corey Stoll. Corey Stoll? Corey Stoll. He was the bad guy in Ant-Man. The handsome oh, yeah. bald guy in Ant-Man. Yeah. Um, and, and Paul Giamatti, who is, you know, if you don't know Paul Giamatti, I'm sorry for you, anybody, but if you're a Disney person and you saw Saving Mr. Banks, he played the chauffeur. Right. That's Paul Giamatti. 
uh, the two of them go head to head every every week, outmaneuvering the other person, trying to take down the other person, and it's brilliant. And the dialogue <clears throat> is very Sorkin esque, very sarcastic, fun. You wish you talked like that. Right. Um, I start. Everybody's fun, smart, charismatic, and brilliant and sarcastic. <clears throat> so it's my favorite show. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I went into that, but why did I go into that? It, to make it in Hollywood, it's every stereotype in terms of you have to take acting lessons, you have to take on camera lessons, you have to take voiceover lessons, you have to do the training. And it's good to take it out here where it's actually happening with the professionals who know what's going to get you a callback, what's going to get you a booking. Um, and you're probably going to audition a lot. <clears throat> um, even once I'd, here, I'll go ahead and you know bust a few myths. Even once I had booked Dee Dee, and that was a complete fluke. That was in 1996. And I had literally been doing voiceover. If you want to call it professionally, go ahead. I was doing a few auditions. That's that's about as far as I'd gotten. And I booked one video game role as a, you know, um, pilot, Air Force pilot number three. Was like <laughs> one role that I'd done. Um, and then Dexter's Laboratory was casting for a voice match for Didi <clears throat> to take it over permanently. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm having a... <clears throat> Santa, Santa Anita's wins moment here with, with my voice. Um, oh, you're good. But once I booked Dee Dee, I still was waiting tables because and, and doing coverage at night. Coverage is when you um, do like book reports on scripts for the studios. That's a job that I was lucky to land, um, having been on the other side of the business for a while in post-production. <clears throat> so um, people were like, I mean, it's weird, right? Like I was doing this series that was successfully on the Cartoon Network and people knew about it. It wasn't the huge bust out hit yet, but it was a series. And yet I was waiting five times a week because I was still auditioning for other roles because you can't make a living off of one series. Right. I mean, I guess you can try, but you're not going to do very well and pay the rent. <clears throat> so <clears throat> to break in and to get in there, you have to keep... Um, auditioning, getting callbacks and booking the roles. And so you're constantly doing that. And as a voiceover talent, I audition 20 to 50 times a week, you know, different scripts on different things. And um, you're constantly doing that because there's new projects coming out and you want to be considered for them. I do get direct casts now. Uh, that's when they, you know, I was honored, so honored to just record. Oh, I just caught myself. I almost screwed myself. Oh yeah, a don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, a Netflix series, or is it a Hulu series? I found shows available on Netflix. Oh, S S Siri wants That's to tell you. Siri wanted, to, <laughs> wanted to help me. Um, I, oh, because I said series. It yeah, must have thought sounds like you said Siri. <laughs> uh, now, I think I can say this. So season two of Solar Opposites, which was uh, created and produced and directed by the same people who do Rick and Morty. Yeah. Uh, it's a great show. I think it's on Hulu, but it, it could be Netflix. I don't know. Anyway, sorry that I don't know that. I got to play Sigourney Weaver on it, and that was awesome. Wow. And they direct cast me for something else um, for another season, and so I was honored to do that. So that happens where you're lucky to be brought back. And, of course, if you're a role on a video game, the cool thing about that is they'll keep bringing you back every time they do, um, what what is it called? Sequel. Download a oh, yeah, oh, like a DLC. Thank you. Downloadable content. Every time they do a re-up of those, you will be brought back for additional lines, most likely, and come back in to re revise your character. Yeah. So um, you do get a lot of direct casting once you've kind of gotten into certain things. Um, but to, to book a commercial campaign, I just booked a Red Bull commercial that's been released recently. To, to, to get those, you have to keep auditioning. So to answer that question, you're always grinding it out. You are always re-auditioning. Fortunately, if you're addicted to acting, like most of us are, if we're doing this for a living, you keep at it even the, through the very discouraging seasons. And there are very discouraging seasons where you haven't really <clears throat> booked as much as you did last season or last year. And so you got to kind of keep your spirits up, your hopes up, your joy for it up, your training up, keep, keep at it. And that's kind of like an accountant 
has to keep rereading and retesting right. to keep their license. As an actor, you keep doing your training and keep doing the auditions to keep your place in line to keep getting the auditions to keep hopefully booking the roles. Yeah, absolutely. That's what that's like. Well, and by the way, if you if you want, I know um, so somebody mentioned in the chat if you needed to take a break for a drink. So if you do need to do that, I, I, I've got you, off screen, <laughs> got you off screen for a second. They were concerned about you. So there you yeah, go. So, um, the one thing, too, that you, you mentioned right before we talked about the TV series and somebody puts it in the chat, you were starting to talk about a triangle of something. And then I don't think we were able to finish that. Call, so, yeah. So, yeah. Because they, that's what it was. Billions. That's why I mentioned billions. Yes. Thank you so much. Whoever. Yay. Good to you. Gold star. Yes, they joked about it because the lead character, Mike Prince, who owned, who's a you know multi-billionaire who owns you know his marketing fund, who's up against Paul Giamatti every week for breaking the rules. He taped, he scotch taped up to the frig, the refrigerator in this multi-billion-dollar you know money market fund, the tri, the golden triangle, which is that you have to have two of the three two of the three triangle corners to make it in Hollywood or to make it in anything. But in Hollywood, um, it's it's kind of like acting 101. And I'm going to try to get this right. I just there was a former there was a cast member in Disney World who DM me and she was so sweet. And I was running through this with her just the other day. Um, you have to have. Talent, luck and perseverance. Those are the the three corners of the triangle, if you have two out of three at any one time, you will make it. <laughs> wow. So if you have perseverance and talent, you will eventually make it. If you have luck and talent, you will eventually make it. If you have luck and perseverance, you'll eventually make it. So as long as you have two of the three. But what does that say? You have no control over one of the corners of the triangle, right? Luck. Right. Unless you're a sorcerer. <laughs> you if you are. Um, I'm not, I don't think I, maybe I'm a little bit magical. I'd like to think, but I can't conjure up a role any more than anybody can. Cause it's out of your hands. That's the big saying in Hollywood. Once you do the callback, it's between the casting director, the producer and God, Yeah. As to whether or not you booked it. So, um, but if you have perseverance and talent, um, hopefully you will make it. And there's some people you know, that you think about and you kind of wonder, how did they make it? Like, how are they a series regular? Because they're not the most charismatic or the most gorgeous compared to 30 million other choices, right? I'm not, I'm not putting them down and I'm not naming any names, but if you've ever had that thought, maybe it's because they persevered for 30 years in Hollywood and finally got, you know, known for having a great work ethic and really caring about people on set and really busting their ass on set. And, you know, that one little spark of luck. So they had perseverance and luck and boom, but it took them 30 years. And there are people like that who literally have been making their living elsewhere before they finally broke in. Hopefully it won't take you 30 years, but yeah. Absolutely. Um, and somebody said that when we were on Haunted Mansion a month ago, it was fun to say, just look, there is Cat. Yeah, no, I know. It's uh, ever since uh, you know we've gotten to know Cat a little bit better. Every time I ride the Haunted Mansion, I'm like, oh, there she is. And I'm listening to the voice there. So that's pretty cool. Well, I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't ruin the magic for you. I hope that the bride stays the bride because well, she's got her own awesome story. Well, I think I think what's what's cool about that, and this is why I I, I, I was answering a couple questions in the chat while you were while you were uh, that way, you know, I didn't interrupt what you were saying, but uh, somebody was talking about, you know, can you do the voices? And I think that's what besides contract stuff, that's all another reason why she doesn't do the voices like just, you know, just for fun, because I mean, yeah, it would be fun. But also it does kind of break away the magic if you see her just, you know, sitting here in regular, you know, regular clothes and not, you know, not dressed in the part in the role or the part doing those voices. I think it might break the magic a little bit. I think you mentioned that on the last interview a little bit. Hey, these aren't regular clothes. These are Hollywood clothes. That's true. <laughs> Darn it. Well, you're not dressed. You're not dressed like Constance right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm totally teasing. I had to yeah. make a joke. Oh, yeah. I looked down on my shirt like these aren't regular clothes. This is a no. <laughs> this is a Gap T-shirt. Yeah. Um, so, I guess other things that are help. I, I'm trying to think of the questions I get asked all the time that I think would be the most useful to anybody. If you wanted, like, if your dream is to make it in Hollywood. Obviously we, we answered, get some acting training, go, go get some after work or on the weekend acting classes, improv, 
if, if it's a good improv class that's well known for really teaching improv skills, so important because improv teaches you how to be in the moment, how to not get in your head and look fake when you respond, how to just spontaneously come out with something that feels authentic and organic and in the moment. Um, it also, it, you know, teaches you how in voiceover, how to ad lib, how to add in things that, that, that how to improv little things that help get you the booking. Um, nine times out of 10, if you ask a producer or casting director, why did you like her audition? They'll say, well, she brought, she added in some things that were funny or appropriate, character appropriate that we hadn't written that, that worked within what we'd already written. Right. Um, so those skill sets really help. You got to be in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago if your dream is to make it an on-camera acting. If you um, really, and, and you can book commercials locally in other parts in other parts of the world, but if it's, if your dream is a TV series or an HBO series or a feature, it's still true that you do have to be in New York or Los Angeles, preferably Los Angeles, just because there's more going out here now that I'm bringing more competition to all of us out here, but that's the truth. Um, and I've even gone down and spoken to cast members down at Disneyland and Anaheim, and I've I've had to unfortunately break the bad news to them um, and you know can see it in their eyes. They were hoping to keep their dream of maintaining their day job at Disneyland and make make it as an actor in Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, you can try. And now that there's more on camera auditions where you're just self taping yourself, self taping is when you literally just record your own audition. But if you want to learn the skill set and be competitive with all of the other million people that are out there auditioning, you have to be in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, or Chicago, but mostly LA and New York, because it just the very vibe of being around that level of talent, that level of fast thinking, that, that energy of everybody's geared to the, the town is geared towards it. There's a lot of access to things that you will need those tools that you will need to actually learn how to, self tape yourself correctly right to audition correctly to um get the call back how to do an audition that gets you the call back um and by the way if you don't know what a callback is i'm sorry callbacks are you know they've gone through the first level of auditions and now they're going to bring back their selects right and in, in case you haven't paid attention to any of the behind the scenes with robert downey jr or tom holland or any of the other marvel avengers you love or um, Disney voice talent you love, there's several callbacks before you get a role uh, at that level. Um, maybe not Robert Downey Jr. back in the day when Iron Man wasn't, you know, there wasn't an Avengers franchise yet. There wasn't a Marvel franchise. It was just a one-off movie. So they may have just given him an offer and, you know, had him audition for it. And then, but to, to book those major roles, especially if you're not an A-list or B-list celebrity yet, you will go through several callbacks to see how you respond in every situation with every new scene. And they'll even bring in some of the actual actors to read against to see what the chemistry is like. And chemistry doesn't necessarily mean romantic. It means how did they play off each other? Right. Tom Holland, um, you know, I, has gone on record many times of saying that he went through several callbacks for Spider-Man. The f first few self-taped where you get no feedback whatsoever, he's just by himself. And then ultimately, of course, the final test was reading against Robert Downey Jr. And it was Robert Downey Jr. who said, I like that kid, you know, and everybody could see it, that right. he had great chemistry, great ability to play off of Robert Downey Jr. But that was the final callback. So um, you will have to learn those skill sets. And the only way to really do that is to be in the town where that's all going on. Um, right. You learn a lot, even even just waiting tables. It's funny, there were a few other voice talent, people who made it in voiceover. There were a few of us at the same restaurant um, at, at one point. And we were, you know, we'd, talk, we'd be studying our sides, you know, in between shifts and showing up early and memorizing our lines. And just, you, just you're around people who are talking about it and learning from other people and listening to what they're saying and stealing from them and borrowing from them. And that's a big important part of it is to actually get yourself to that town. So that's the next thing. If you are serious about doing it, um, 
voiceover, you can make somewhat of a living remote, but again, you're going to have a much better odds if you're actually in the towns where the casting and the, and the actual recordings are going on, which is New York, LA, Chicago, and to some extent, some of the other major metropolises. Awesome. Well, yeah, and, and I, that's. I hope there's a lot of people really listening and chiming in here. They're very interested in 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 uh, everything, and I hope there's some people out there that are striving to do that and definitely be encouraged that you know, yes, it is a lot of work, but it is doable. And uh, yeah, all the things she said. I hope everybody you can go back and watch the stream again and take notes. <laughs> um, this is a really good question though from the chat actually. So and and it falls a little bit in line with 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 not a little bit a lot in line with an experience that you've had. And uh, we don't have to get too far into this. It's up to you. But the question is. Uh, Can I just interrupt you for a second? Yeah, please, and please, say, please. You're doing, you're doing such an amazing job at this, John. Uh, Josh. Oh. John. I'm. So, I am so sorry to say that. No, you're Josh. good. You're good. Um, because this is a lot for him to balance too, and I love all of you for having real questions. Ask me real questions. Yeah. There's nothing that I won't answer. I may take a positive spin on it, but I will answer authentically and truthfully. And Josh, you're doing an amazing job of following the feed and put. Because I'm not seeing them. So, you know, getting the questions to me, you're doing a beautiful job. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, this is a really good one. So, and like I said, it does fall in line with, with some of your experiences. And again, uh, it's totally up to you how far you want to go into this. But um, uh, basically it says, what happens? Um, let me scroll up to it again. There we go. I'm wondering what happens when your voice is your livelihood, of course, as, as yours is, and your voice is hoarse, and you're due to go in for your voice role. Can they work around you until you can go back when your voice is better? Of course, you've got a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, major story with that. But also, there's also, I'm sure there are times just when, you know, you need a couple of days if you've got a cold or something. So how does that, how does that work? And again, you can get as far into that as you want. So <laughs> that is such a great question. And I've got a lot of answers for it. Yes. And there's different, different scenarios. So it's a very true, very true thing. And it's, again, one of those, whoever said that, good for thinking about it, because it is, it is um, true. You have to take really good care of yourself if you want to do voiceover specifically, because no, they will not work around you. Um, that, tr that ad is, you know, all about Eve, if you've ever seen that or any version of it, there is always somebody waiting in the wings with just as much talent and way more energy and youth on them than you have, who will eagerly step in. Um, I mean, if it's if it's a day or a week and you're a series lead, obviously, you know, you've established yourself. If it's a one off thing, you know, they may try to work around you. But even then. That's one of the reasons why I broke, I had a job. That's sorry. Let me say this right. That's one of the reasons why I have a job as a celebrity voice matcher. If the celebrity can't show up for their animated series for three weeks in a row, they will look to find somebody to voice match them. They won't get replaced in the credits and they probably still are getting paid, but um, they're also going to pay a professional voice matcher to fill in those lines so that they're not behind production three or four weeks. Um, right. That's a little bit different um, it, because there is a delay between animation and release. So they may be able to catch up that celebrity, you know, four or five weeks. But I have stepped in on video games because the talent suddenly got laryngitis or got the flu. Um, I have taken over roles. I won't get the credit in the credits, but I will get paid. Um, they, you know, they are respectful of the fact that if that person earned that role and is known as that role, they continue, you know, so when I voice match Sigourney Weaver for various features, nobody knows that I voice matched her. It's not going to say in the credits voice match by, uh, they'll put, I'll get lumped under additional voices. And then it's anybody's guess what voice I did in that. Oh, my candles are shaking Ooh, <laughs> from the beyond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Regions beyond. Um, so you have to take really good care of your health so that your voice isn't impacted. Here's a fun anecdote for anybody who loves dirt on Hollywood. We struck, voice talent struck for the first time in history uh, four years ago. No, eight years ago. See COVID, I have COVID brains, like the blip, Right. I lose it. Um, basically, yeah, we struck for the first time because 20 some odd years ago when our union, which is SAG, 
after now it's SAG after, but back in the day it was SAG. When they negotiated video game contracts way back in the 90s, when video games were just adding voices, just had the technology, they undercut us. Our union sold us out. Wow. I happy to put that, you know, out in the universe. They did. They we had a terrible contract for terrible pay. They got us for four hours on our feet doing um, up to three different voices for the same amount of money, three different characters, and they could do whatever they wanted with us. Meaning if it were a battle game, think of your favorite battle game, um, they could have us screaming for four hours straight. You try screaming for four hours straight. I couldn't do it and for an hour, <laughs> let alone four. Yeah. You can't. No. Your voice can only take so much. It's right. not your vocal cords are not meant on the evolutionary scale on any level to be screaming at the top of your lungs. No. For that amount of time. So, it was an abusive contract. It was unfair. Right. And they could do it legally because if you accepted the job and of course we were accepting our you know, you would pray that you would compassionate people on the other side or smart people on the other side who wouldn't direct you into the ground. Right. And I did early on have sessions where I lost my voice midway. I mean, how could you not? If you're playing a witch who's screaming for two, you know, three or four hours straight, of course, you're going to lose your voice. Right. And you would even lose it during the session. So they weren't smart on their end either, because what are you going to do? The session's over going to have to bring her back or recast her. Well, they can't and defy the laws of physics. It's just physics. It's like your voice yeah. is eventually going to give out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's called vocal stress. And we now have, it's now built into contracts for video games and animation that if it's a vocally stressful job, you know, whatever it may be, that they can only use you, they can only get you for two hours instead of four and that they have to give you at least 15 minute break every hour. Oh, so good. they really don't get to keep you for 45 minutes doing that. And if they're smart, they're not going to have you screaming the whole time. Maybe they'll have you whispering or maybe they'll have you do intense reads where you, your energy is up, but you're not screaming. Right. Um, so, you know, like if you've ever, if you're a parent and you've ever spoken forcefully to your child, you're not screaming at them, but they know. Right. Or your pet, they know because you've got energy behind it. So maybe they're changing up the lines a little bit. And that's what we struck over. And it the struck the strike went on for um, I think it went on for a full year, either a little over, a little under. And video game production stopped. And the video game companies all were, you know, some of them went non-union, which is fine. But most of the video games rely on union talent, particularly the ones that have celebrities in them. And the celebrities were, you know, struck as well because they're union. So basically, video game production just halted. And these multi-billion dollar corporations figured out, okay, we have to figure out a contract. We also now get a version of residuals. Um, residuals, if you don't know what those are, that's where, you know, whatever I've done in the past, it's animation or tied to a TV series or movie, when they rerun it, we get a little piece of, you know, it's, it's based on some algorithm and some um, formula so that every time it plays, we get a, you know, a piece towards that. So, you know, that's why the Friends casts. Oh, yeah. You know, that's why they're set for life. I mean, every time those yeah. syndicate, they're getting huge bank every time. Right. It's a ritual. And it's a, it's a small percentage of what, you origi what your original contract was. So if your original contract was a million dollars an episode, you're making nice bank no matter what, ver oh. you know, what free run it is. Yeah. So we didn't have those for video games. Now we have a version of it. It basically, I don't want to bore you with it, but basically it's a formula where we get some piece of the action every time we record. And um, that's important because if you go back to me, you know, telling you what it's like to make it in Hollywood, where you're going to have some slow seasons, you're still auditioning every day, several times a day. You still have to make a living. You still have to pay the mortgage. You still have to pay for your kid's college tuition. So those residuals become crucial it's 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 paying off for your dues paying it's for all those years that you auditioned for free and never made a buck right get something in the piggy bank towards you surviving through the slow seasons if that makes any sense whatsoever and it's interesting i get into nice arguments with producers sometimes who make fun of us and say oh you voice talent you have it so easy show up for two hours a day four hours a day uh, 
make a huge living. And what they're forgetting is that we could go through, some of us will go through seasons where we're not booking anything, maybe. Right. The luck of the draw. And um, hopefully you were smart enough to be saving towards those slow seasons so that you're still paying the mortgage during them. See, I'm being very real. Yeah. Um, it's not all, and it's not that for everybody. And again, the longer you've paid your dues, the longer you've been established in the industry, the more likely you'll get direct bookings and you'll keep going even when you're not getting new gigs, you're getting called back for old gigs or you're remembered for being great on season one of something, they'll bring you back for season four. I, I'm hoping I'm answering productive oh, questions. Absolutely, yeah. you know, that was that was great. And uh, yeah, I, I actually, when you talked about the screaming for, for four hours and I've got somebody in the chat here, Nero, that says that he's a voice talent and it was barely able to do a loud gravelly voice for 15 minutes before it started hurting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's oh, yeah. That brings up a good point, actually. They say that all the time in voiceover don't it's in bold and italics on the script do not audition this if you can't maintain that voice for an hour at least wow so you have to pay attention to that because i can manipulate my voice to sound like scarlett johansson and make it work for an audition right you know for, for the 15 minutes of auditioning that i'm going to record it at my microphone i can cheat and do something to see if you know what scarlett johansson is. she's got that awesome sexy gravelly damaged vocal cords, which is why she's got that awesome scratchy sound, right? Right, right. It's so appealing. It's so interesting. Texturally, it's so awesome sounding. I can audition and sound that way, but can I maintain it for an hour to four hours? No way. And you will lose future gigs if you do. I'm not saying you did that, by the way, lovely voice talent who got screamed out of your mind and, you know, that's different. But if you do something to manipulate your voice for an audition and you can't maintain it for the actual booking, yeah. not only will they kick you out, but they will call your agent and say, don't ever have her audition for me again. Wow. Because she embarrassed me in front of the clients. Yikes. Yeah, no, yeah. I, that, I, I, can, I can see that's a very high stakes thing. I always think back to, uh, when we talk about vocal stress, I always think back to one of my favorite old TV shows that I haven't watched for a while, but uh, 24 with, with uh, Jack Bauer, Kiefer Sutherland. I feel like he was screaming the whole show. I, I, I can't imagine that, what that must have been like. I don't know if you ever watched that, but he, he literally, he was intense. His voice was intense the entire show. So. Well, it's a little, I'm not saying that it's good for the voice, but it's right. a little bit easier on camera because if you think about it, they're going to set up for a shot for, two hours that's true they're not doing it constantly yeah. yeah and then and then he'll maybe scream you know three or five takes and then he'll be back in his trailer, trailer. drinking tea or bourbon or whatever he wants to drink you know for the next three hours so no, you're right. that's true not quite the same as doing it back to back and to answer your question i mean i've lost gigs i flew out to new york here's a real sob story just to let you know that i'm human and that i went through it and i had to learn the hard way i i was young and probably 31, 30, 31. And I got an offer to be the voice of a new network. And they wanted to try me out for a week to be their promo voice. And so they flew me out to New York, um, paid me a little lump sum to be out there. Not a lot, just, just enough to survive basically in New York for the week. And um, I was supposed to do several sessions, drama, comedy, you know, we were going to record a bunch of stuff. And if everybody liked me, I'd be the ongoing voice for that network. I got a horrible flu. Oh, no. And lost my voice. It was my first night in the hotel. And I woke up the next morning. And you know that it's sore. It's yeah. swollen. It's sore. And I sounded not like Scarlett Johansson. I sounded like, I could barely talk. Like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and I called my agent and he said, I hope you're kidding when he heard my voice. I mean, he, and he wasn't like being funny. He was like, yeah. I hope you're kidding. And I was like, no, they'd, they'd paid for me ahead of time and flown me out and put me up in a hotel and paid for my plane ticket. And I, I called my doctor and pleaded. I mean, I was willing to do anything bad, illegal, just to get my voice back. Right. Um, did prescribe steroids, but steroids take a day to kick in and they don't heal it completely. And when you're, even if I got my voice back, I didn't have my full range. Right. Of it, was still, it was still damaged. Yeah. Damaged. So I didn't get the gig and yeah. I learned a very hard lesson. Take really good care of yourself. If you're going to be traveling and flying out for a gig, like don't go partying, 
Don't go to the, your friend's birthday party. Don't stay up until midnight watching your favorite, you know, shows on TV. Right. Go to bed at 9 a.m. Wake up early. Drink your orange juice. Take your vitamins. I mean, I learned it. Yeah. It was like the universe's way of saying, yeah, you want to do voiceover for a living? Take good care of yourself, girl. Right. But profanity. Well, well, yeah. And that's, <laughs> and that's the thing is, yeah. Of course, yeah. L- luckily, we're all family friendly here, but no, I get what you're saying. So, uh, well, and, and actually, what's interesting is, um, you know, is that that's something that you know you don't think about because everybody thinks, oh, the world is just this nice place and everybody is understanding, and they might very well understand, but it doesn't matter because the show has to go on. So that's yeah. So that's the unfortunate truth of of what's going on there. And I do want to read. I did want to read uh, Narrow Road here that the voice actor that was in here a minute ago. Uh, said um, just to, to answer the comment there about the the fifteen minutes. He said yes, the job only required him to do it for for fifteen minutes. But he's just making the point that yeah, definitely like you were saying, not doing it more than you should and not doing it more than you're capable. He said so basically it was fifteen minutes he re- was required to do and that's all he could do. So so that was that was good. But yeah, so awesome. and that brings up another point. Also, I mean the ramifications of all of that that brilliant question that whomever it was set it off in terms of do you have to worry about your voice. Think about it this way also, I'm auditioning for video games every week and I'm very good at doing monster voices like early on for whatever reason. And I don't like scary movies. That's always the inside joke about the bride as I was terrified of the mansion when I was a kid. I don't watch the horror movies. I'm not into them. Um, I don't like scary things. I don't like aliens and creatures and like, it scares me. I'm such a coward about all that stuff. and. Um, yet I'm very good at alien voices and monster sounds and creepy sounds. Those always are vocally stressful because you're manipulating your voice to sound otherworldly. Right. So you're, you're manipulating your vocal cords and I have to, for auditions, work very hard, um, some days. And I do mean this, like to talk to my engineer, like, okay, we get one take. Yeah. I better, I better not screw up my lines. I better really make be clear on and also screw up the directions because they'll give us weird directions, you know, within the weird voices. And I know I've got one shot to get to do it because if I don't cut it off at one, I won't be able to a audition other voices Mm. later that day, therefore lose other future jobs. And B, if I do have a real job the next day or that week, I won't be able to do that well either. So you got to think about all this stuff and it can sometimes you have to make smart decisions and say, I'm going to have to sit out this audition from Sony. Yeah. As if I do give it everything I've got to book it, I may book that role in a month, but they're going to kick me out of my McDonald's session tomorrow because I'm not going to sound good. Right. Oh, it's probably, yeah, you have to prioritize for sure. Absolutely. Um, and this is, you kind of touched on this earlier, but there was a good question in the chat I wanted to touch on as well. Um, just talking about, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, here we go. It's just, just talking about how you, um, how you make yourself stand out. Uh, and, and if you're in a, if you're in a, you know, in an audition, a callback or whatever it is, um, Besides, I know you did mention like making yourself stand out by maybe adding a little something or adding your own spin on it, studying the character enough to add something authentic, whatever that is, uh, or if you, if you even can study the character if you don't know. Either way, what are some ways that you uh, personally have or that you know of people making themselves stand out more so that they do get that call back or even get the booking? So that is such a great question, man. And it's one that you hopefully don't forget. I have to remind myself, hopefully at least once a week, to, to be clear on the answers to that. So there's, there's two, to, to my mind right now, what's occurring are the two really important cliches, which is one, be your most authentic self, be, be the, bring to it what you personally believe you can bring to it as you. And that by that, I mean, it's so funny. I was watching, it's not a great movie and I hate to even bring it up because of a certain celebrity who, canceled himself a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, I know who you're talking about now. <laughs> but um, I was watching, uh, it's not a great movie, but it's fun. It's corny. The Bagger Vance movie, Legend uh, of Bagger Vance. Yeah. And there is a saying that that ba- the character Bagger Vance says repeatedly in it. Again, this is not one of my favorite movies, but it's. I remember thinking out loud at midnight while I was working on my social media, getting ready for my Disney history the next morning. Um 
wow, that's said really well. That's that's saying the same thing that we all know is talent, but putting it in a different way, giving its own spin and reminding me once again, how important that is. Play the game that you were born to play. That's his advice to Matt Damon's character who lost his way and, and lost his swing. You can't play like anybody else. Don't try to be anybody else, which is almost impossible if you're a human being in the United States, right? right. I mean, with social media, don't you find yourself at least five times a day, like secretly wishing you had A, B, or C from A, B, or C? I mean, it's what our whole freaking culture has become is comparison. Oh, it's, it's easy to compare yourself and you have to be so careful about that. Yeah. And in acting, it's a real, it's a real foxhole that you can fall into repeatedly is that, you know, you want to book the role. So how can I, what do they want from me? What can I give them? What are they looking for? What you got to somehow cut it off and just remind yourself, you got this, you trained for it. You've done the training. You've worked your butt off <laughs> to get that audition. Trust yourself and bring to it what only you, Kat Cressida, can bring to it that nobody else will do as well as you because you're being authentic to you. So that's going to sound kind of corny and hammy, but for example, no, I get that. If the, if the character's written as dry, sarcastic, and witty, which comes up often enough, I have a very dry, cutting sense of humor. It's what my family did when I was growing up. I can out sarcasm and get a laugh out of probably anybody else if I'm being true to myself. I don't get to do it as often as I'd like. Um, but, but that side of the mouth, sarcasm underplay, you know, underplay the line. If I stay true to myself, I may not book the role, but guaranteed I'm going to get somebody's attention because it's going to be funny because yeah. I know how to do that. That's me. That's, that's who I am. Right. Uh, I'm not trying to be somebody, but unfortunately, a lot of times I do fall into the trap of, they say, bright, cheerful, joyous, and I'll try to give them a version of bright, cheerful, joyous, and forget my other attributes. So the best answer that I can give anybody who's hoping to make it and make an impact, and all you can do is do your best audition. That's where that triangle thing comes in. Luck is going to come in and perseverance is going to come in too, because it's not just going to be your talent. It's got to be other things that play that get you the role. But if you stay true to who you are, and I do mean that, what you bring to the table that nobody else can bring because that's who you are you will stand out eventually in the right role not every role but in the right role yeah um the other way that you can stand out obviously is to relax your do all the things that a good actor technician does um i just threw in a word that we use here in hollywood actor technician take care of yourself get a lot of sleep so that your brain can fire on all thrusters constantly without cocaine. Um, and some people, you know, have used that to help their brain fire, but you can't maintain that for very long. So get a lot of sleep, eat better than you want to, not so that you look good so that your brain and your body's staying healthy. Right. Uh, and that is a, a truism that you got to just accept. You can't have the pizzas as often as you want or that, <laughs> down home southern cooking or that disneyland food you can't do that constantly or even three times a week and maintain health and 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 your vitality and your energy you can't do it on just caffeine so there's all this boring stuff that goes into being your best self but if you maintain all of that and you show up and you're prompt and you're respectful and you're kind and i do mean that um, you got to be respectful and kind to people, even if you've got a little bit of success. And that's not a cliche because people, there's a lot of talented people in this town who have canceled themselves. And I, I mean that sincerely. There's, there's some people who people don't want to work with anymore right. because they've gotten arrogant or they're not pleasant to be around. And if you're going to spend four hours in a voice session or, or, you know, a week on set with somebody, you're going to pick the person you're going to enjoy being around than the person who's a dick to be around, right? Oh my God. No, <laughs> we, no, you're fine. But yeah, I get, you get the point. It's you, you're not, you don't want to be around people that, that are unpleasant. And I, I think what's interesting about that is I throw something in real quick is the people 
that even in, in my industry, there are famous people in the band world, in the music world, of course, famous conductors and stuff. All the best, famous, most famous conductors, Juilliard School of Music, all those people are the kindest, most down-to-earth people. It seems like the better they are, for the most part, the more down-to-earth they are, which is really awesome. But then you've got those those jerks, and I think a lot of people, they just they don't want to work with them. So anyway, yeah, go ahead. And it... It's all the way, uh, this is sort of answering your question. Trust me, I'm, I'm not just trying to go this Cinderella, be kind and courageous and da, da, da. It, it really is Spielberg for all his success. Every producer director faces this in Hollywood. There's a, there's a business side to it. And if you haven't heard this awesome story about, um, sorry, um, when he wanted to do, what was it? Which movie was it? Where he couldn't get the funding. I think it was Indiana Jones. Oh wow! The Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was one of one of those movies that became one of his. I can't remember. It wasn't Close Encounters. Maybe it was Close Encounters. I don't know. He got a reputation on his first few movies of always going over budget, because he was new, because he was a kid, because he was brilliant, but he didn't know how to manage time and schedules, and went way over on Jaws. I mean, so even though his movies were a hit, the studios were like, uh, uh-uh. uh. I'm not giving him I'm not giving him the next movie because he's going to blow us so far out of budget. And what if that movie isn't a hit? The bean counters at the studios care about that. Of course. So there was a time when Spielberg could not get the funding for the movies. He wasn't being hired as a director. Even though even 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 with his resume, he still wasn't getting jobs. Even with his resume. But because he hadn't been a dick. There we go again. Because he hadn't been mean to people because he'd been respectful and a joy to be around. Other big names, Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, other friends, homies back in the day, studio heads, other people stood up for him and said, you know what, take a risk one more time on him. Because while while he does have this bad habit of we'll reel him in, we'll, we'll make sure he's better this time, but he's so great. Actors love him. He makes such good movies. He's a joy. He's because he was a nice guy, a good guy, he got his second chance. Yeah. It's crazy to say that. Yeah. But because he was respectful and kind to people, had he been like other famous directors who are very successful, but not nice to actors or other producers, he wouldn't have had a second chance. So you really have to remember that people make yourself pleasant to be around. Yes. And that even if you're in a bad mood because your kids were bad that day. <laughs> you're a generally nice guy but if you are mean to the catering person or the costumer or the wardrobe or the makeup that gets around you get a rap for being a prima donna and even that goes for voice talent so to book things to get back to your you know how do you stand out get a reputation for being pleasant and you know and, and cheerful and a joy to work with do your best and that is sometimes acting as well oh absolutely Sometimes have to fake it, but better you fake it than you, you know, get a reputation for don't bring them back. They're a pain in the ass. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Well, and, and I think, you know, I mean, that goes for a lot of things in life. It's really important for sure. And, and, um, you get a lot more. I don't know. I, I always, it's so funny as a, as a, as a teacher, as a band director, I have to be, you know, I had to be in front of 150 people in a marching band for a long time. And, and uh, there are mar- marching band directors that scream and yell all the time. And then there was me. I'm pretty chill most of the time. And when I did talk to the kids, you mentioned that intensity. There were times when I spoke softly, but with intensity and they knew that I meant what I was saying. So I think there's a way, other ways to get your point across besides being a jerk, I think. But uh, so I totally agree with you on that. There is a question from somebody here, real quick. I know we're getting up on two hours here, so we probably, probably, are, I don't want to keep you too long. But this is a good question. Somebody's got a, um, just kind of a technical question here about about a job. Uh, this person has Drew is his name has just booked a job at Trillis Studios that Disney uses, I guess, coming up. What should I expect at the studio, and how fast paced is it? That's an interesting question. I don't know if you're familiar with Trillis Studios, but congratulations, Drew, on booking that job, and good luck. Um. Well, since I don't know the context of. Yeah, maybe I, that may be tough without the context, but I mean, uh, in general, how fast paced is this? I mean, I know it's probably different for each studio and each job, but. What is it? What is he? What did he book? I mean, what is it? Anime? Is it animation? Is it? Uh... Uh, let, let us know, Drew. He, did, he didn't specify. So let us know, Drew. That might help her answer the question a little <laughs> bit better. That's true. No, I, it is hard to answer that without that more information. So uh, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see if he comes back in the chat with the answer there. But in the meantime. 
Uh, let's see here, and maybe if there's one or two, one or two final questions, and then we can wrap up. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Um, Joy in Minutes is one of the people in here that's really been interested in um, in getting into the industry, and she says that. Um, um, he, she, sorry, I'm not sure, but, but says that, sorry, if I'm getting the pronouns wrong, but she's, uh, they say that basically, um, that they want to get into the business, but they also, you know, are kind of struggling with anxiety. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's something that we all struggle with at times. Um, so as we're waiting for Drew, oh, he says video and audio Drew, be a little more specific and we'll be right back. But, uh, dealing with anxiety, is there any, any, uh, tips or tricks you have for dealing with anxi anxiety, especially as you're just starting out? Um, well, everybody gets nervous. Uh, so I don't know if we're talking about clinical anxiety, you know, uh, or circumstantial anxiety. True. Um, I, I get nervous all the time. It's part of what feeds the adrenaline. Um, staying, I, I guess when I get really nervous, the best way that I can talk myself down from the tree or off of the limb is to remind myself that I got myself there. Like I'm, I'm, the universe is handing me this opportunity in a sense because I've worked hard and earned it. And that usually calms me down a little bit. Wherever you are in it, whether it's auditioning, trying to get an agent, doing a reel to get an agent, you got yourself to that point. So give yourself kudos for the courage and you know the audacity that you had to basically follow your dream. Right. And um, just to remind, just to throw it back to my roots on social media and why I went into acting in the first place. Disneyland was the place that fed a lot of my early dreams, having no clue that voiceover existed. So I wasn't trying to be a voice talent. I, I knew I wanted to be something creative, maybe an Imagineer, maybe a writer, maybe a producer, maybe a director. I was a kid, but I knew that I loved the stimuli the, the stimuli, the stimulus of what Disneyland offered in terms of organic storytelling. And it's a very, the park is very different now. So the Disneyland that I went to in the uh, mid to late seventies and early eighties and onward right. through the early two thousands was a very different place. There was a lot more organic storytelling and shows, brilliant shows. I'm so sad for, for current generations that don't get to see the amazing things that we got to see. Um, but Regardless, um, even the, the early classic attractions, some of which are no longer at the park, there was a, a sense of tremendous talent behind them that was so inspiring. And even Walt's story, which my dad was very authentic about, my dad did not try to paint Walt Disney as this saint or this god who had magically come down from the universe and bestowed Disneyland on us. He loved telling me the, the dirt you know, the bankruptcy stories, the overextending himself, the losing Oswald, the having his heart broken. When his animators walked out on strike, rightfully so, because they weren't getting paid what they deserved from Uncle Walt. I love Disney and I love Walt, the man for what he created, but he was a human being and he had right. some serious flaws. Right. And those flaws and knowing the true stories of him crashing and burning or how audacious Disneyland was and that nobody believed in it and called it Walt's Folly. I loved that because it reminded me who was struggling to make it as an actor that I may fail. I may fall on my butt and totally mess up that audition and have them call up my agents and say, wow, she was scared. You know, she, I don't think she's ready for prime time yet. You have to be willing to take those risks and you have to expect you're going to be a nervous wreck. But try to remind yourself that A, other great people have failed many times before they made it. And B, it's okay to be nervous. Just remind yourself how you got there in the first place. And maybe that will at least get you back in touch with the joy of why you're there. It's hard in the moment. And I sometimes, I've messed up callbacks out of nerves because of who was on the other side of the glass. Right. I'm not gonna name names, but there's some major creators, producers, directors who I have had the honor of doing a callback for, and I couldn't get, I couldn't get back in touch with me. I was so focused on, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, that I couldn't remember why I was there in the first place. Right. That's, that's a very, it's a very human response. Sometimes the, the, the fan kicks in for sure. And I, I would think that would be hard. Um, 
this is actually a fun question maybe to end with because uh, we, we I know you, we mentioned this on the uh, on the last um, interview a little bit of some of the things uh, that you know a lot of this person says downscale says a lot of uh, a lot of voice acting uh, he assumes it's mostly solo reading which I know you've mentioned it is but are there any times when you when you've done a back and forth with another actor in the studio and if so who are your favorites to work with or has it mostly just been solo work? Solo is in not solo Star Wars. Oh, solo is in um, like yeah, as, as in like you're no, the only one in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> um. Some okay. For 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 callbacks, sometimes the producer, creator, director will either themselves read in against you just to read it like old fashioned acting, or they'll have a reader they're reading in with you, which is fine. It's great. If you're a voice talent one of the skill sets you learn early on in the training, going back to the dues paying and why you do anime or why you accept the low paying gigs first or why you um, do all the training is you learn how to have the imaginary, the imagination required because you are auditioning by yourself the first round. Um, you, you don't ever really have somebody reading in, in with you, against you. You're in your, these days, especially with COVID, with the big uptick, uptick in, <clears throat> home studios, you have to develop the skill set, not only of reading against nobody, but conjuring such a real nobody on the other side of it, that they buy that you're talking to somebody else. And that is its own skill set, which by the way, on camera voice talent, on camera, sorry, I said that on camera talent, don't have to worry about. Um, because you have to audition by yourself, but usually you'll have a reader on the other side, even when you're doing on camera auditions, usually they recommend you having somebody read in with you. So um, if you book a role in on camera, you will always be playing against somebody, right? They're, right. Unless you're doing a monologue, maybe, maybe then they'll clear the room and it's just Tom Hanks and the crew doing the monologue uh, by himself. But by the most for the most part you've always got somebody stimulating you giving you some lines in voiceover even when you book the session you will be reading your lines almost always against nobody yeah not always when i did dexter's laboratory <clears throat> it was the unusual situation of um they wanted all the actors there at the same time which had its own pros and cons and then you have to learn certain rules about how to deliver in a room with other people and not step on their lines uh, or or accidentally cough or sneeze. I mean, it's like things that you wouldn't think of that suddenly really matter. Right. Because uh, even if your mic is turned off, they may hear it in the background. But the bottom line is, yes, it is a huge skill set in voiceover to learn how to conjure up and make real the person you're talking to. And that that's acting. That's legitimate acting skill sets that are very hard. It's not easy to sound believable to read a script you've never seen or rehearsed with very much and to figure out what the producer or director is looking for character wise to read off the script and make it sound like you're not reading from a script and to also deliver it like you're really talking to somebody as opposed to just talking to nobody out loud. It's That's why the training is important. And that's why I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, I mean, when I used to give advice sometimes um, in seminars or workshops, people would argue with me. Like, you know, people who wanted to make it in voiceover but felt because they'd taken uh, high school acting classes or acting 101 in college that they had what it took. And I'm like, okay. I mean, unless you're incredibly gifted naturally, I had, I sucked when I started. I had to learn that, <laughs> you know you don't learn that stuff magically overnight. You have right. to really practice it and work it. And you have to get the feedback and be willing to take the feedback from the director, the casting director, your coach. You don't sound like you're talking to anybody, Kat. I still get that in auditions, by the way. My engineer will say, it was good. I didn't really buy that, you know, your younger sister was in the room with you, that you were really scolding them. I have to not only take that in and know how to adjust, but I have to learn the skill set of not saying, oh, I believed it. Right, they right. You know, if, if he didn't believe it and he's my engineer, chances are the auditioner is not going to believe me either. 
and then I won't book the job. So you got to get really good at taking feedback and not arguing with people, even if you even if you were feeling it. <laughs> that that's interesting. I, I mean, honestly, I, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, a, a lot of acting, of course, on camera is playing off of the other actors. And, and of course, if you don't have that person in there and you're, you're supposed to be scolding your sister or whatever, but that person's not physically in the room for you to actually play off of, that's, that creates a whole extra challenge for sure. Absolutely. I can't tell you how much, how many times late at night when I'm watching Billions or you know, rerun of Sex in the City or whatever happens to be on while I'm doing my late night social media and, and bookkeeping. How many times I think to myself, arrogantly, stupidly, I think on camera talent, I have no idea how easy they have it. They're so lucky they're in a room full of other actors. <laughs> you know, because you get, that stimulates great performances to have other great actors working against you. Of course. I'm, I'm saying that halfway jokingly because, you know, it's a whole different, then you're dealing with a whole other skill set of being an on-camera talent. Right. Um, and I left on-camera acting because I didn't have what it took to be awesome on set for 18 hours and not get bored. Right. That's a real skill set too, to know what to do with yourself and to stay on for 18 hours. So pumped, so motivated that the moment they call you back on set, you're there for your scene you know, ready to go to cry your heart out or right. to break up with your boyfriend for the millionth time or to get a laugh out of the audience. I didn't have that stamina and that love. I didn't love being on set the way you need to love being on set. And I figured that out early enough to go, I love the auditions. I love callbacks because they're like theater. You're in the room with the producer, the writer, the director and the other actor. And you're, you know, it's like a theater experience. But once I got to set, I wasn't the most awesome, grateful talent in the world um, in terms of, you know, internal thoughts. So I think I was on two, God, what was it? Two guys, what was it called? Ryan Reynolds sitcom, Two Guys, A Girl in the Pizza Place? Something oh like yeah, that I, I was gonna say, I don't, it's not coming to mind right now. I did, I did read about that whenever we were, <clears throat> setting up for the first interview, but yeah, so you were talking about it, I think at one point on the last interview, but, um, well, there was, there was like one moment I remember I was like sitting in my dressing room forever and my dressing room smelled like mothballs because <laughs> they had it for the wardrobe. So they had that awesome, awful, you know, menthol smell of mothballs. And I've been, and, and you had to stay in your dressing room as a talent. You don't wander off. You, they have to be able to find you at a moment's notice. Right. If they need, you have to stay in your dressing room and you can't mess up your wardrobe. I had to sit like perfectly. Don't wrinkle anything. Don't mess up your makeup. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your hair. Oh my gosh. You're basically like, yeah. And and I'd been there for like four hours and they'd gone way over shooting schedule um, with Ryan Reynolds and whoever else was on the soundstage. So we're talking in the late 90s, right? This is way back. But I was going nuts. I was like, and we didn't have smartphones back then. Right, you couldn't just surf surf the internet on your phone or watch a show or anything. But even that, that gets, you know, you get numb doing that after a while. Uh, like, well, yeah, after a few hours, for sure. You got to have that, that built-in part of your DNA that's fine with it and not only fine with it, liking it and enjoying it enough that you're pleasant to be around and that the moment they call you back to set, you're brilliant. You're there. Julia Roberts has that. Brad Pitt has that. Tom Hanks has that. The minute they're needed... Something clicks and they're brilliant the moment the camera's on them. And that takes a lot of mental presence and a, and a gift. Right. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't hack it. I was like sitting there going, I know I should be grateful. I know sh I should be feel lucky that I'm, you know, in makeup, in wardrobe, about to go on set as the newscaster. That's what I was playing was a newscaster talking about condoms. It's funny. <laughs> I remember that. And, and I wasn't loving it. And I thought why am I going to keep doing this if the, when I get my big breaks, I'm not loving it. Well, yeah. If because you don't love the day-to-day -day work, how you do it. Yeah. And it is work. Right. It is a level of, of whatever skill sets are needed. It wasn't in my toolbox to be brilliant all the time. If you're stuck on set for 18 or 20 hours. And, um, and I say stuck on set. That's a horrible way to put it. If you're lucky to book something, I, I was fine the first three years. I loved it for the first three years. And then it just kind of, I realized something in myself that I needed to be doing more. And fortunately voiceover, you know, provided an answer 
and I got into it before it became massively competitive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this comment here. Uh, Narrow Road, one of our voice actors that's on the uh, on the the stream here, says, "Yes, uh, this is back to what you said about taking feedback. You have to be willing to take feedback, whether you agree or not. But you can ask questions to get clarification. Quick questions just don't sound like you have an attitude. Uh, it sounds like that sounds like a good a good plan." <laughs> that is also a skill set when the director says, "Be more yellow," and you know <laughs> they're they're fragile too. You know, the directors, the writers, right. the producers, they're nervous too. It's their show. Not always, but you do get, you can, you know, the, the young video game directors, sometimes the, the people who are um, newer at having a game handed to them or trying to prove themselves to their studio, Bethesda or, or you know, Ubisoft or whatever the, the studio is Sony. It, it's their, their life on the line too, so to speak, their career and right. they're nervous. And if you accidentally hurt their feelings yeah. and, you know, people who are artists are fragile. You can say something and mean it, you know, J Josh, you and I had a joking conversation about this the other day. It's subjective, right? How you say yeah. something and how it's perceived. You can mean something totally nicely. You could totally mean the nicest thing in the world and think that you're being uh, respectful and offend the other person. Right. Not only offend them, but to the point where they, it stays in their heart. And if you do that, it doesn't matter if you were well-intentioned, you're not working for them again. So you got to really learn uh, the, a, a method of uh, like what Nero, Nero is saying, Nero? Nero is road, saying, yeah. yeah, that you have to ask the questions in a way where you sound like you genuinely are asking a question and not passive aggressively insulting what they just said to you or that you think it's a stupid quest or a stupid request. So and this is my fav favorite example i did once book a commercial and the director the voice director did say to me the client uh, producer said to me i just need it more yellow <laughs> and i said i'm sorry did you say yellow and he said yes just just think more yellow think yellow and part of me wants to say you know okay well you can't bleep me out but no insert the f word i want to say what the is that yeah. What do you, but I can't sound like that or say that. Right. Um, so I said, I'm so sorry. I just want to make sure that I give you exactly what you're looking for. Oh, there you go. So when you say yellow, do you mean, and now I'm having to self direct in a sense, do you mean brighter? You're translating. You like, yeah. Yeah. Do you want it like, do you mean sunnier, like more cheerful? Do you mean like more upbeat? Do you mean brighter in terms of energy? Do you mean, like, I'm trying to figure out what the heck yellow what means. What does yellow mean? Yeah. And um, I don't even remember what I got because he wasn't sure either. And <laughs> it was, but you don't want to get into this dynamic, which right. can happen. And again, you're dealing with egos. Right. And you're dealing with people. So don't bite the hand that feeds you. And um, sometimes, especially on video games, if you've been standing on your feet for three hours and you've been screaming, and you've been doing emotionally challenging, you know, clicking in and out of emotions can also be mentally draining and physically draining on your feet. Yeah. Um, I, I choose to be on my feet because I'm I'm better on my feet than I am sitting in a chair. Some voice talent can bring it full on sitting. I can't, so I have to be on my feet. And um, you have to really hold yourself back when they say something like, Kat, that was great, but when you do the last word, just give it a little more bite and and you're like we've done 16 versions of this line and now they you know and they're still not happy right and and he's still looking for more and you just have to be really good at going great got it okay cool even and though you're in your mind you're going oh my goodness <laughs> like just get, you know, you're kind of getting it like as a human being you're you're becoming annoyed with this but yeah out outwardly it's all, you're you're acting when you're not acting right you're like okay i got this we can totally do that <laughs> like yeah and by the way ps some people are naturally really just joyful lovely sweet human beings to the core some people just are so grateful all the time to be alive and you know you know who they are oh yeah because you being around them i am not one of those people i'm somebody who has fought hard to be back you know everybody's heard that part some of you people know about that part so that's part of it too i'm also not 20 anymore so you know things as you get older uh the body does start to have more things that it's telling you i'm tired 
my voice hurts, my throat hurts, right? I'm hungry, you know, like all these things kick in and you just have to also build the skill set. And, and I say, practice it in real life. When you're at the grocery store, practice it. So if somebody, or on the freeway, it's really easy in Los Angeles. Well, yeah, when you're stopped forever. No, no I'm talking oh. about road rage. Right? Oh, somebody road cuts rage. You off and rude or doesn't let you into that lane. It's really easy to get angry in 60 seconds or less um, because you're late and you're already running late and you're stuck in your car and somebody just does something rude. It's really easy to, to default to your worst self. So I remind myself, practice being in the booth. Say thank you to that person who just came. <laughs> oh my it's goodness! Muscle. No, that's it's, it's so, yeah, it's so funny, and it's 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 not nearly as bad here in Orlando. But yeah, the traffic is the traffic is getting worse here. It's nothing like LA because I've been there and I've driven in it, and I know how horrible it is. But uh, but yeah, it, you know, I, I actually have been working on that a lot myself since our accident a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's that that. Um, you know, if, if I always tell myself, if I hadn't been just, if I had been just a little bit more patient, you know, it was the other guy's fault, but if I'd been just a little more patient, it might not have happened. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to practice being patient and, and not worrying about when somebody, you know, so I think that's a great, that's a great comparison uh, on the road. Cause we all have to deal with that in some way or shape or form, unless you live out in the country. So, um, and there's, go ahead. since we're, we're going to wrap very soon and, and yeah. hopefully we'll, we'll mention my, my special live event again. For yeah, absolutely. Those who are- by the way, everybody who's hung in there on your Easter weekend watching this and enjoying it, I don't know how many are out there right now or who's going to see this. Thank you so much. How awesome of you to give up some of your Saturday for this. I hope that it did something to entertain or enlighten or, you know, make fun of me. Oh, um, no, absolutely. I, People are loving it. I really appreciate it. But one thing that I remind myself a lot out here at, at the lower ends when you're depleted or you've done your 30th audition and not gotten a booking that week. I mean, it's re- there's so many things that can happen that that can affect you. And if you're an actor, y- you are an actor most likely because you're sensitive, for better or for worse. To access those emotions quickly, you've got to have some amount of sensitivity, emotion-wise, right? You can't be like a, a steel trap of, of a human being. And by the way, my some of my dearest friends do like computer IT for a living, and they're steel traps. Like something goes wrong, and they yeah. are cool as can be, and no emotion comes out, I'm the opposite. I freak out. So um, there's that great Buddhist saying that I I learned very early on in LA that people were passing around as like, you know, a, a life secret, which is that in every moment, there's a million choices. That's a uh, translated roughly, that's a, a Buddhism saying, which puts the responsibility on yourself. And I love that you said that out loud, Josh, because no doubt we feel on a day-to-day basis like something wasn't our fault or that we didn't have a say in it or that we didn't have control. And as an actor, <clears throat> you feel that almost every moment because you signed up for it. You are an actor. You are the talent. You are not in control. You are a prop. You are a element. You are a piece of the puzzle, a piece. And there's a million other pieces that go into that puzzle to make the final product. You need to keep that in mind on all levels. Humility, to keep your spirits up when you're not booking, to remind you that you do have some amount of control. It may not be the massive control unless you are Steven Spielberg, but even, there's my story, even Spielberg didn't have final control. Nobody really ultimately has final control over anything except is, you know, the higher power. But whatever that version is for you, remind yourself as much as you can as an actor and hopefully as a human being in every second, you have a million choices. What do you want to do with that second? And if you go on that microscopic ant level of thinking, it, it has wider repercussions. And I'm not trying to sound like Gandhi here. I mean, like when I have another audition sent to me at five o'clock at at night and I've already auditioned all day long and no good news came back from anywhere in the universe that day. I have a choice. I can bring my best self, cool off for a second, take two sips of Diet Coke or lemonade and get my butt back in the booth and give it my all and remind myself that that's my job or I can go different places. Right. It's you have control over that. You do have a choice there in that moment. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad that you said that. And a lot of people in the chat are responding very, 
uh, positively to that. It's 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 so important, you know, when we're out in the world, and you know, I get presented with those situations with students all the time, and how you react to a student that maybe isn't having a good day, or or at Disney World, you know, we have other guests that might might frustrate us sometimes, and and you know, I have definitely been very guilty, even on live streams, of maybe not making the right choice of dealing with somebody who might be uh, you know, less than kind on stream or something like that. But I think as we get older and more experienced, all of us are getting older and more experienced, whether we like it or not. I think it's it's so important important to remember those all those choices that you have and and, and uh, ultimately usually the, uh, the the calmer choice is usually uh, is usually easier and best for everybody and I, I've been learning that more as I as I get older because I, I'm like you I, I tend to respond emotionally to things and 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 I tend to be a you know wear my heart on my sleeve kind of person and and uh, and I can still do that but I can also do it more calmly so I, I appreciate that you said that <laughs> yeah the the term in psychology is being non-reactive which yeah. it doesn't sound, which doesn't mean how it sounds, but it means if somebody accuses you of something or attacks you or says something unkind to you, rather than throw it right back at them like a 13 year old or an immature American, you know, America, I, ha I have to say this out loud, there are other cultures where you learn this as a child, deep respect for the other human being, even if what they're giving you doesn't feel respectful. Correct. There are cultures that teach you um, India is, you know, a good example of a culture that early on teaches you that the only thing you control is yourself. And we don't learn this in America as, as a skill set at all. As kids, we see our parents react. We see people on TV react. We see the media doing their ridiculous gossiping and reactive. But if somebody throws something unkind at you or, or not even unkind, just in the moment doesn't feel good. And you want to like, you know, feel good in the moment by you're always going to do better if you try to be non-reactive and you just basically sit with it for a moment. And even if you don't like it, just say, okay, that's, that's real skill. I mean, it that is. takes Gandhi level, you know, <laughs> but you can do it. Yeah. And, and I've, you know, I've seen people that I 20 years ago, cause you, you know, it's a small town. I've seen people grow and I've seen people learn that skill set. And I think to myself, good for them they survived because you, you're never going to survive in Hollywood again if you don't master that. Um, people will, you'll eventually get weeded out unless you are so talented. And there's obviously, you know, like a handful of people that we've heard about are prima donnas, but they continue to work because they're so talented, not actors, by the way, uh, that, that actually took a turn once the me too movement hit um, and the whole Harvey one, you know, all of that, it got a lot more clear. They're not going to hire you if you're going to do something um, illegal. Oh, right. Or not right. Something accepted. But there are some directors and producers out there that are still abusive to the people they work with who continue to work because they are so talented. I'm not one of them. So I can't, I can't, I can't be that way. And probably you aren't either. Not you, Josh. Whoever's out there. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to name a name out loud, but there's a few people who have a reputation for, you know, obviously not being the greatest on set, but they are brilliant and therefore they continue to, you know, bring in the bucks. Well, and I think that's that's it's so important because, you know, you can be you can be great at something and you can be that good. And that's wonderful that that person was was uh, either worked to develop that talent or was blessed with that talent and everything else. And that's great. But to me, I'm a lot more interested in how that person treats people. And I'm a lot more impressed by that, I think, than, than uh, the talent, because some of the talent is genetic, some of it's worked for, some of that stuff, or like you said, the person who's genetically blessed, that they're very beautiful or very handsome, and those things are, you know, just luck. Uh, but I think that, you know, the way you treat people, that's one of those million choices, and anybody can do that and treat people well, but but not everybody chooses to do that. And I, I much more respect the people that have a lot of talent that treat people well. So I appreciate, again, that you said that, because I think it's, it's so important. So everybody, no matter what your job is, is. even if you're you know behind a computer or like our friend Britt who you know, only only uh, who uh, you know has to do IT for people maybe asking questions that are not always you know questions that he wants to answer it might be the same question 20 times in a row and you're always patient with those people and and uh, and treating them with, with kindness and respect no matter what so I think that's so important for sure and I wanted to honor our friend Drew here uh, who uh, I asked about what he was doing he had that job at Trilla Studios and he said so I don't think this is something that 
uh, you know, that, that, that Kat has done before. So I'm not sure if she'd be able to answer this, but uh, I just wanted to honor his response here. He did say uh, that his job was uh, as a camera, a cameraman and audio technician. So I don't think Kat, you have done those jobs, correct? So I don't know if there's anything really you could probably say about that, but I wanted to at least say that was his job. So congrats on that. I mean, so that people, because we're this is starting to sound like we're doing romper room with all the life lessons here, and I don't want it to feel no, that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, for it's sure, for sure. About how to make it in Hollywood, which is that you do have choices and you may have to self, you know, they call it self-soothing. You may have to remind yourself that you do have a choice, even if it feels like you're you're helpless. Right, But um, But to answer Drew's question, just really listen. I mean, that is a skill set that takes some cultivating that I didn't have when I first started doing what I was doing in post-production. Um, observe, listen, stay very quiet. If you're, a, if you're a talker, a chatter, a gregarious person, awesome. Put that in the pocket, leave it in your um, glove compartment and vow to yourself that on your first week on the job, your job is to listen and to take in and to just say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Got it. Thank you so much. And if you need clarification to very politely say, I'm sorry, when you asked me to do that, just so I get it right, can you explain that more clearly or can you go into that a little bit more? Um, a lot of us first day on the job, Hollywood or not, but especially in Hollywood, we're so full of other emotions, adrenaline, joy, excitement, nerves, anxiety, uh, you know, you name it that we shut down some of our mechanisms accidentally and we're not really present and really paying attention to everybody around us who knows a little bit more than us. And it's just really important to just remind yourself that your job, your first and foremost job is to learn and to get better at what you do. It is also to do the job you were hired for, but you wanna do it to the best of your ability. And the only way you're gonna do that is to try to just really take in what everybody else is telling you. And, um, I literally will sit with myself before walking into a session. Sometimes if I know that I'm anxious, I had a session the other day. I hadn't walked back into the studio since COVID. And I realized I had butterflies in my stomach because I was going to be live uh, in front of, you know, the director for the first time in two and a half or two years. And I had butterflies in my tummy and I, rather than jumping into it and racing out, even though I was like a minute late, I kept myself in the car took some deep breaths from my diaphragm and told myself, your job is to learn. Your job is to listen. Your job is to just be there in the moment. Everything else will take care of itself. That's your job right now. And it calmed me significantly to remind myself that I didn't have to do anything other than to just show up and be there for them. And that, you know, obviously the voiceover was gonna kick in when it needed to kick in because I've got 20 years of experience, hopefully. But so I didn't have to worry about my performance so much. I just had to stay open to their feedback and to be not look like an anxious mess walking in, which I was. Absolutely. So, yeah. No, that that, oh, that. Yeah. He says, thank you, Kat. So, yeah, that was very, very helpful. Very good. I love the, the listening thing It's such a great skill in any job, but especially uh, in Hollywood when there's so many moving parts and you have to learn so many things so fast. So that's very, very important for sure. And listening, yeah. I think, is a skill we can all work on. So good. Now, I, I actually think, uh, I know we kind of you know, got onto the, the the self-help thing a little bit, but I think it's, or not self-help, <laughs> but whatever you want to say, but I honestly think it's really good because I think everybody struggles with these things. We all have, you know, the light and the darkness and the, the you know, the, the good self and the worst self that we can choose at any point. And we've all been on both sides of that spectrum, you know, multiple times. So I think it's really cool to remind everybody and ourselves of that. So that's great. Well, uh, before we go, I definitely want to... Um, to, no, I was uh, going to give you one, Josh. Oh, go ahead. One Disney question. Okay, let me switch it so back to you. Here. So let's have one great Disney question from somebody. Okay. Anybody. A Disney question. All right, guys. So uh, you want the, you want, you were saying you want somebody in the chat to ask you a Disney question. Or if you've seen one that we were oh. ignoring because we were trying to focus on Hollywood. So actually, no, I didn't ignore any Disney. Uh, everybody, I think everybody was kind of on the same wavelength as we were. We were talking about Hollywood and voiceover and acting and everything. And so yeah, I didn't. Well, now, wait a minute. Let me see if I. OK, no, there was a Disney question. OK, so somebody asked. Uh, they were very interested in your work with Jesse the Cowgirl and wanted to know, uh, number one, a little bit about, um, you know, uh, what that was like and also uh, what what. What programs or what what uh, what what shows or what uh, events did you that did you voice Jesse on? Oh, okay, yeah, that's a great question. So I'm very honored to be her official voice match. 
for every major Disney or Pixar character, um, they'll have at least one person who's did the, the designated voice match who went through auditions and callbacks um, to fill in for when the, you know, the original voice, the, the real voice is not available. So uh, I booked that way early on uh, back right after Toy Story 2 released. And the first gig that I had, I wish to God hadn't been my first gig because it was a huge, oh my gosh. It was for the live show at Disneyland, Woody's Roundup at the Golden Horseshoe. And because they had like a couple of seasons where it was like, it was adorable. And, and you can see it, somebody, it, it was like Florida, some Florida tourism site shot it in its entirety. And it was an awesome show because when Woody and Jess and everybody was live talking to the audience, they were in color. But then when they, they would do like the recreation of the Woody's Roundup show from the 1950s, that's in Toy Story 2. Right. Um, everybody was in black and white. The whole set and all the costumes were in black and white. It was so cute. And they would recreate, you know, cowboy crunchies and the commercials and all that. It was funny. Um, so I got booked to be Jesse, the voice of Jesse for that live show, um, recording it. And I also had to learn how to sing, sing as Jesse, which was much more difficult. I, First of all, I was newer in voiceover. This is like in the, God, when did Toy Story 2 come out? I mean, I feel like it was in the late 90s. Hmm. Am I remember Or early 2000s? I can look it, it up. The late 90s. Oh my gosh. I can look it up real quick. I'm going to shout it out real quick. Okay. okay. Anyway. 1999. It, I, yep. You were right. 1999. Yeah. So I've been in voiceover for three years and I had been developing voice matching as one of my skill sets and, and you know, but to be told we'd like to bring you in for this. I had pre-auditioned months before, laid down an audition at Disney Character Voices as Jesse to keep on file because they didn't think they were gonna need a voice match anytime soon for her. So they just kind of had that on file along with other actors. And all of a sudden I get this call before the weekend that on Tuesday, so I get told on Thursday that they'd like me to come in and it was a direct booking. Like I didn't have to audition for that show because they, they'd already auditioned me, you know, a character Disney character voices months before. So I hadn't done her voice for a long time. And that I was not only going to be voicing her, but singing as Jesse. And thank God I sang because I remember thinking, what if I wasn't a singer? And there are great voice talent who aren't singers, right? But thank God I had musical comedy in my background. But then I had to learn how to sound like her and sing, and she didn't sing in the original. So I didn't have a, a roadmap of what she sounded like singing. And while that may sound obvious to you, engaging the singing and the voice match were two totally different things. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, as so, somebody who works with singers a lot in what I do, I, I can definitely see that, that it's hard enough to get somebody to sing well with their real voice, let alone with the voice that's not their not their normal voice. Absolutely. And plus there was no um, roadmap for it. so. I didn't even know if they were going to like my version coming into the studio of what it was like. They may go, well, that's great, but you don't sound like her. Right. You sound like her when you're talking, but you don't sound like her when you're singing. So, and she had to yodel. Uh, it was Jesse, the yodeling cowgirl was one of the songs we were singing. Right. So I had to learn, I went to a music specialist, a singing vocal coach to learn a little bit about yodeling, which is a whole other skill set. Yeah. So that was my first job as Jesse and thank God somehow I pulled off good enough for what they wanted for that. And then there were other live shows and, and events that happened. And then there, of course there was um, attractions with Jesse in it. So I voiced her for those attractions. So you voiced her for Toy Story Mania. Yes. It's actually both me and Joan Cusack. Oh, both you and Joan. Okay. Yeah. There's different scenes where it's me and different scenes where it's her. And fortunately nobody can tell the difference. And oh, no. even I've been occasionally, which is great. No, what do you mean? Oh no, it's great. But yeah. You can't tell it between me and Joe. No, That's no, I said no, I, I said I yeah, I was gonna say I, I definitely I definitely can't tell. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, it's um and um, then uh video games, you know, voice for video games. Um sometimes she does stuff, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's both of us on the same project. Yeah. 
And what about the, um, I, I was thinking about this as you were talking about the, 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 the first uh, job there, but um, there is, there's some dialogue that Jesse does with Rex uh, as you come into Toy Story Land there at the roller coaster at Slinky Dog. Are, are you, did you do some of the, the lines for that or is that something they took from, uh, from Joan? Um, I hate to say it, but I don't know. Because again, with some, when we go in to do these things, sometimes they don't give us the real title for something or tell us what it's for. So it could have been, so yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we're told it, sometimes we're not. That that doesn't stand out to me. But then again, they could have they could have done those lines as part of another session. You know, like added it on as part of another session and bumped up my fee slightly, and I didn't know that it was for that. So um, I haven't been to Toy Story Land in Florida, so I don't know. Okay. The, Absolutely. Yeah. So cool. Well, I think that's, that's great. So there's this, and this one won't, this is the last Disney question. This one won't take very long. I don't think uh, to answer, but I just thought this was really a good, uh, a good question. Steph has asked, um, uh, not, not my Steph, but a different Steph in the chat has asked, uh, what, what did her dad think when she got to do a voice on Haunted Mansion as somebody who worked, you know, your dad worked with Imagineering. Uh, what, what did, what did he think about that? Um, it's such a beautiful question. I'd like to think that he was very proud of me. He was no longer around. He moved on. So unfortunately he did not live to see that. Um, but I'd like to think that he was proud and <laughs> thrilled. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Sorry about that. But yeah, that definitely, uh, that was a good question, Steph, for sure. It's very, very, I'm sure he would have been very proud. So very cool. Well, yeah. I think, um, I think that's all, um, that we have here as far as Disney, and we, we definitely have, have, have covered a lot of really, really interesting topics here. I don't think there was anything else about Disney. Okay, cool. So yeah, <laughs> I was just looking, because there's been so much chat that it's kind of like, I, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm looking over here at the chat scrolling, and I, you know, it all kind of, all the words start to run together after a while, so. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure. But uh, Yeah, I love you guys all for showing up. So just to remind you, and, and I can answer questions for you live, because this awesome event that I'm doing, uh, Josh, if it's okay to just wrap it up. Yes, please. This. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, April 30th. It's just in two weeks from today, which is crazy. Um, but that's part of the reason that I'm doing it is that I'll get to actually meet you guys, Disneylanders, Disney fans. Uh, I'll have the chance to talk to you live and answer questions and, you know, take pictures with you. And I'm just super excited. It, I haven't been back in the park um, since the whole COVID shutdown, except once to do a photo shoot for social media <clears throat> for a Disney event. And, and that wasn't really enjoying the park at all because it was just taking photos and just trying to deal with, you know, what that's like, uh, working around guests. So I, it's going to be my first time really doing something that feels like it's a piece of the park and taking a piece of the park to you guys. And it's again, raising some great funds for a great charity. And again, it's going to be at Chalice Collectibles. Be sure you're following them to see updates and all the amazing things they do. I'll be signing anything you bring, I'm signing. If you have something you want me to sign or things that they're selling or things that I'm selling, Honda Mansion merchandise and eight by tens. And it'd be great to meet you. I, I miss being at the parks. Um, there were, there's been so many cool incidents in front of the Honda Mansion where I got to meet fans. And I really miss that part of it because that oh, yeah. was always so cool. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah, that's that's like that's your attraction. So it's really cool if people people recognize you and see you. And 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 quickly as you're on that topic, do people when you're there? Do people actually like just randomly? If you're at the haunted mansion, do people randomly recognize you? Be like, hey, you're the. Do they? Does that happen sometimes? It's only, yes, mostly cast members. <laughs> hey, that's cool. That's cool. Because they read, because they read up, they're handed a little portfolio a, a you know a a, do, a dossier of the history of the haunted mansion and apparently i'm in it now you know who, who's the bride and a little history about her that she was a cast member and and then people google me you know so cast members do regularly recognize me because if you're working the mansion you've put in a special request to work the mansion it's it's hard to get that duty as a cast member in california at least that I that I'm aware of. So they're passionate about the mansion. So I get I get recognized. That's awesome. And then um, and then once, only once, I was standing online, um, literally about to go in, like making that turn into the the foyer, 
And from somewhere back in the line, I, I heard a, like a Southern mom voice shriek out like across the entire queue, um, you know, Cat Cressida, oh my God, look, it's Cat Cressida. <laughs> and, but, and of course, everybody else in the line just was trying to look at who the crazy woman was who was screaming at the top of her lungs. And she like lunged through the line to like, she was hauling her poor embarrassed daughter with her. <laughs> and um, the daughter's a big fan of the bride was dressing up as her at Halloween. And like the poor daughter was dying. And um, I was really caught off guard because I'm not ever, ever somebody who gets recognized in public, nor should I be. And um, I was just sort of thrown for the moment. And so the, I remember the cast member like unhooked the little chain and I was kind of like ushered out of the line before I knew what was going on, um, just so that they could deal with whatever was about to happen. Um, which I thought was very smart of them. Yes. <laughs> so it was, because there were people behind me, of course, annoyed because they didn't know who the hell, heck, sorry, the they hell didn't know who the heck that was or why I had stopped and was stopped in my tracks and not entering the foyer that they'd been waiting online for an hour for. Right. So I, I was pulled out of the line and said hello and the poor daughter. And I think we exchanged emails or something just so that I could get back online. That that happened. That's awesome. It was weird. It was, yeah. it was weird and funny, and I don't know what, I still to this day have no idea what was so important to that mom, but it was very important to her that the daughter meet me. Yeah. And the daughter wished to God she was dead. <laughs> no, yeah, well, and that's, you know, it's, it's funny because as, as, you know, obviously nobody nobody knows who I am outside the parks, but Jen and I get stopped, like, constantly in the parks now because you know, we're, our faces are on, on YouTube all the time, but... But uh, yeah, there's times when we have to kind of go aside in the line or something like that. So I do, I do understand that. It definitely is. Uh, the first time somebody wanted to meet us, I was like, I, I was like trying to get out of the way. I was like, there must be somebody important behind me. You know, so so that was kind of a funny experience the first time. So I totally, I totally get that. Um, and um, before we, you were talking about the event, and somebody asked if you were going to have DD Funko Pops too, as we as we kind of close yeah. on talking about the event. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, every. The great thing about Chalice is that they really do, because they have such a broad reach, they do have some Jessies. They've got, you know, the bride, they've got some of the blue brides. They're not gonna be, those ones, of course, that are vaulted are not gonna be inexpensive. I'll have a few of those as well. And a ton of DDs, because thank, thankfully those just finally in waves are dropping around the United States. So people pre-ordered them back in like September or October. Cool. And they just finally made it over. So yes, they've got a ton of DDs and a ton of of uh, stretching room constants, hatchaways, and then some of the other ones as well. Cool, awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so guys, uh, again, the link is in the description. Um, it is it is in the description down below, and uh, you'll see that um, the moppers are posting it. So all you have to do is click that link and go to the uh, the um, Instagram post by Chalice. They actually have that graphic that Kat showed on her phone earlier. If you want to share that on your social media and tag Kat, I believe, Kat, real quick, just because uh, this, uh, like I said, this is something that just came yeah. up recently. If you want to uh, one more time say how they can get the signed picture, because I yeah. know that a lot of people were interested in that. Oh, great. So, um, no, obviously I'm going to do my best to honor everybody, but forgive me, I'm only human. And if I get an incredible amount, it's probably right. going to be a first come first serve thing. And I apologize, but of I'm offering to help spread the word to Disneylanders, to Disney fans, to pass holders across Southern California. Um, if you will post that image, which I have, which I'll send to you um, if we end up connecting or I'll send to Dave. I don't know how we're going to, we'll, we'll figure it out. But one way or another, if you post it on your main feed, not to stories, but to your main feed, and put a caption under that lets people know when the event is, where it is, you know, and what's going on at it. Um, and you tag me um, and you say, you know, also Kat's going to be donating partial proceeds to No Kid Hungry and you can tag them too, because they've got an Instagram tag. Um, I will then send you a signed eight by 10 of the bride. I will get that sent out to you in the next, you know, month um, as a thank you personally for me for helping spread the word to Disneylanders and Disney fans. So 
that's that's the offer and I'm good for it. And it would be great to see it on a whole bunch of feeds. You got to make sure I, I'll say this out loud. And thank you so much, Josh, for giving me the spotlight for two seconds to say this these days on Instagram so that you can claim your prize if you do this and we get that far. Make sure you photo tag me and put my name in the caption and make sure that it's tagged. Because if you don't do both the photo tag and the caption tag, I won't see it in my activity. That's how they've got it now with Instagram. So you got to make sure that you photo tag me and you tag me in the caption. So you got to do both, guys. So make sure you do both. Uh, do both steps there, because otherwise, if you know, you might do it and it might be beautiful, but she's not going to see it, and then she's not going to know. So you got to make sure you do and both. I'll be able to paint you and get your address. And and again, please, you know, I'll do my best to get it out to all of you karmically. I will owe it to you. And if you don't get the sign eight by ten and it just doesn't work out circumstantially you've done some amount of good in this world raising money for kids who are starving so that will come back to you guaranteed you know either way so thank you from my heart for that and for following me and for caring and for everything that you guys do i think you're amazing people have been asking me if they can get a signed pop if they're not in disneyland i i don't yes. know if that's but so you know josh when you graciously announced me some of the comments from your gracious post were, can I do that? The answer is yes, you can DM me. Um, just bear in mind, of course, I have to do a certain amount on my end to make that happen. So it's not the in-store signing price because I have to actually get to FedEx and guarantee it. And, you know, I have to do, so it's a little bit extra surcharge on top, but yes, I can do it. And those proceeds also, if you do that, will go to No Kid Hungry. So it all goes around. It's still going. Yes. And I, I, I want to definitely vouch for, for Kat on that as well. It is, it is a huge effort. You know, now we're both on the screen. It is a huge effort uh, to do that, to go to FedEx and to do all those things. So yeah, I, I would definitely understand that that there will be obviously a, an additional charge there. Obviously, it's easier if you're in the event, but if you're not in California, understand it's kind of like ordering something. You know, when you're not at Disneyland, you kind of order it from you know somewhere else. You have to pay a little more for it. So that's understandable for sure. Now, um, thank you so much, Kat, for being on. This has been such an amazing interview. We have talked about so many different topics, and everybody in the chat has been super positive and super kind. So thank you to all of you resort hoppers for being here tonight and and like kat said taking part of your easter and passover weekend and and, and and or whatever way that you celebrate we appreciate you being here uh and being part of this this magic and definitely we appreciate anybody who's watching on the replay that could be here tonight we appreciate you as well and definitely even if you're watching the replay all these things still apply but kat did say 48 hours on the sharing that that needs to be done and if not like she said it's just a nice thing that could be done uh and that the, the, it's something that could be helpful to these kids and these charities so yeah, by 48 hours, we're counting it from like starting tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, because tomorrow's Easter. Right. So, and it's gonna first come, first serve. And I don't expect Josh to be dealing with this until Monday. But Josh, you and I will talk about it for two seconds also how we're gonna try to organize that. But um, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm just grateful that you showed up and that you care about this stuff. And like Disney always said, I hate to end with the cliche, but it's fun. It's fun to make the impossible happen. It's fun to do the impossible. Breaking into acting is up there on the bucket list of impossible, but you can do it if you persevere and you work at it. I believe in you. Absolutely. You really can do it. That's right. And there's another another Disney quote, which wasn't Walt, but if you can dream it, you can do it. That's a that's another Disney quote, which is really wonderful. So awesome. Well, as we say good night, we, we also use another really cool Disney quote here on this channel. And that is we say have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, just like from uh, from the uh, Carousel of Progress. And so, Kat, if you want to do the honors after I say have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, if you will just say bye bye to everybody, I think that'll be great. Everybody will love that. That's how we end all of our streams. So. Okay. So, all right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being here and we will see you all um, on the next one. So <laughs> we'll see you all very, very soon. And uh, Jen will be live on Monday, by the way. So don't miss that. Jen is going to be live at uh, Magic Kingdom on Monday. So we'll see you as then. All right, everybody. So for now, have a great big, beautiful tomorrow. Bye-bye.